A very warm welcome and good morning to all present here. Uh, good morning to all the colleagues and participants from India. Good afternoon to people who are joining from further east. And uh, maybe good evening to people who are across the planet. And a very, a very uh, big thanks to them for keeping awake at this hour to join this, uh, this webinar. So my name is Rupesh Homia. I'm a scientist at C4 Aircraft, and I dabble uh, in wetland biogeochemistry, where I work on mangroves as well as freshwater ecosystems. It is my great pleasure to welcome all the panel members, speakers, resource people who have made time to uh, participate in this event and share their wisdom, knowledge with all of us here. I will be moderating this session today and I'll be introducing all our speakers, panel members as we go along. But before that, I would like to uh, give a brief introduction about this uh, workshop, this conference, how it came about to be and what it, are its objectives and uh, uh, what we want to achieve from this gathering. So uh, this Mangrove Conference started as a conversation between myself and uh, uh, Dr. Nehru Prabhakaran, who is a researcher at WII, thinking about what we can do to bring together researchers from India, the subcontinent, as well as Southeast Asia, and see where mangrove research is going, what are recent advances, what are knowledge gaps, and where uh, uh, future direction we can go towards. Uh, this was thought out a, uh, as a platform which will promote more recent advancement, keeping in mind what are the challenges that we are facing. So briefly, our motivation was uh, focused on shedding some light on, on, on the blue carbon ecosystems, mangrove ecosystems uh, play an important role. And the focus was that conservation restoration of coastal ecosystem or blue carbon ecosystem offer excellent opportunities and nature-based solutions for uh, excellent opportunities for nature-based solutions for climate change, but at the same time, these provide important co-benefits such as preserving coastal biodiversity, sustaining livelihoods, and maintaining ecosystem services. So it was pretty clear why these ecosystems are important. It's about time we start taking them seriously, start discussing uh, how we can enhance our understanding of these ecosystems and how we can address the challenges that are uh, being faced by these systems. So during the three-day event, three-day conference, this is to serve as a knowledge exchange platform where these advances and trends in mangrove research within Indian subcontinent can be discussed and some information gaps can be identified. So this is not something where this is like a unidirectional flow of information. We envision this as a platform for exchange of ideas, exchange of knowledge, and that will lead to further interactions among mangrove researchers, among practitioners, policy makers, and will result into partnerships and research collaborations between individuals as well as institutions for advancing mangrove scientific research in India and in the region. The challenges we face today in terms of climate change, in terms of disappearing biodiversity, in terms of a curtailed flow of ecosystem services due to various uh, pressures need to be taken as a collective uh, response. We all need to come together to identify the solutions to the challenges that we face. And we, uh, um, C4 Recraft, as well as WII, the, the, the two uh, institutions that came together for this workshop, do intend that this, this conference serves as that platform where all of these ideas can be shared and uh, new directions can be identified. Uh, the, this three-day event is divided into three themes. Today, we will be talking about mangroves as nature-based solutions to climate change. We have an excellent lineup of uh, speakers, researchers from India who have 
been working on mangrove ecosystem, focusing on different aspects of uh, biogeochemical cycling, the carbon sequestration benefits that mean these mangroves provide, and how these could be uh, a great solution, a great uh, um, um, a great part, in, a play a great part in addressing climate change by providing carbon uh, sequestration as well as adaptation. So we will hear from seven speakers uh, today. Uh, initially, starting with one keynote speaker, then a couple of talks, and then a panel discussion. This will be our. Uh, uh, structure throughout this event. Every day we will have a keynote speaker followed by a couple of focus talks and then a panel discussion to delve deeper into the topics that were discussed today. Tomorrow on 9 December, the theme of uh, our discussion would be mangroves for coastal resilience and biodiversity conservation. So here we will again have a great lineup of speakers covering different aspects of coastal resilience, biodiversity conservation, the social and economic underpinnings uh, that are important in coastal settings and that uh, can sometimes provide opportunities of uh, addressing some of these challenges. On the last day of this event, uh, that is 10th of December, we will have a discussion focused on more recent advances in mangrove research, sort of looking at the new horizons where more work needs to be done, where knowledge gaps lie, and where the future directions uh, could be explored in, by, by using the collective knowledge of individuals as well as institutions coming together and addressing these challenges. We again will have a, a great lineup of speakers. Here on third day, we will have some international speakers who can shed light on mangrove research undertaken in different areas. What we can learn from, from other experiences, from other research, and how we can use those to build a, a, a research program uh, focusing on Indian mangroves. So with that brief introduction, I would like to uh, begin the, uh, our uh, uh, program proceedings by inviting our first speaker. Today, we have pleasure uh, of having a director of WIA, Dr. Dhananjay Mohan with us, who will be opening or inaugurating this uh, meeting by providing inaugural address. Let me briefly introduce uh, him. He has a, a stellar career in, as an Indian Forest Service officer. He is a 1988 batch uh, officer from Uttarakhand Kader, and he has been serving as director of Wildlife Institute of India since January 2020. Earlier, he has served as principal chief conservator of forest planning and finance management and chairman of state biodiversity board in the state of Uttarakhand. Dr. Mohan has been a passionate bird watcher and nat naturalist for nearly four decades and has many publications on every fauna and birds. His uh, detailed bio is at our uh, workshop webpage and uh, to not go in detail and, and save some time for, for his uh, uh, words, I will uh, encourage everyone to go on the website and find more information about Dr. Dhananjay as well as other speakers. But uh, here I would like to invite Dr. Dhananjay Mohan to give our inaugural address and share his thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Dhananjay, and a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rupesh Bhumia. And thank you for inviting me here today on this very, very important uh, conference three-day conference on, on, on an ecosystem, which is, I would say, a magical ecosystem. Uh, this, uh, I must first of all, thank and congratulate all the organizers, uh, CIFAR, World Agroforestry, USAID, and of course, my own institution, and particularly Dr. Rumesh, Rupesh Bhumia and Nehru, uh, Dr. Nehru Prabhakar, who have taken a lot of efforts to organize this. And I'm sure it's going to be a very, very fruitful, uh, three days and will definitely take mangrove conservation much ahead than what it is today. Uh, 
I haven't really worked in mangrove areas, but I've been to many mangrove areas. I've I've uh, spent time in Sundarbans, which is the largest uh, mangrove area, uh, both the countries put together, India and Bangladesh. I've also been to Andamans, Pichavaram. I mean, a number of uh, mangrove areas, and it's really something amazing to see mangroves, the kind of adaptations they have developed in very, very special circumstances and uh, doing so well in, uh, in those conditions, which actually otherwise look quite inhospitable. And they are supporting a whole gamut of uh, biodiversity, a very unique biodiversity. I'm a bird watcher, so I, I go to these areas to look for some birds which are unique to mangrove ecosystems. So they are very, very unique and very special. They may not be occupying a very, very large area in the world. I think uh, just about 150 or 1,000 square kilometers. But I think the value they have, and you will all be discussing and debating that over the next three days. So uh, once again, thank you very much, all the organizers, for organizing this and, uh, and taking mangrove research in Indian subcontinent. And also, I mean, when we talk about uh, uh, the Indian subcontinent, uh, uh, then, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, this entire Southeast Asia is also linked um, ecologically, climatically. So what happens in Indian subcontinent is quite relevant to this area as well. And of course, when we talk about uh, mangroves, I think globally, uh, we need to learn a lot from what is being done in one area from another, because mangroves behave quite similarly across the world. So uh, talking about the Indian subcontinent, India uh, is, has got a very high mangrove uh, species diversity, uh, nearly some 45 species of uh, mangroves out of the 70 found globally are found in India. So India definitely represents a good amount of biodiversity of mangroves. We don't have, we are a large country, but we don't have very ex ex large extent of mangroves, just about 5,000 square, square kilometers which is barely 0.15% of the country's area. But I think the ecosystem services they provide, and this has been proven time and again in recent times, uh, they are definitely disproportionate to their size. They are doing much more ecosystem services than their size. So mangroves uh, play a very crucial role in maintenance of coastal biodiversity and economy and livelihood along uh, a huge coastline of India, some 7,000 odd kilometers long coastline. In fact, I remember long back, I think 20 years back when I went to Sundarbans uh, and interacted with the local people as well as the managers there, forest managers, we, we came to know of a very interesting fact that actually after Sundarbans, uh, the conservation was intensified. The fish catch in the surrounding area actually increased because this, the mangroves were acting as a nursery where the fishes were breeding and moving out uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the mangrove areas and actually helping build livelihoods of people in a better way in the surrounding landscape. So this is just one example. And I think in, 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 the, in some of the recent cyclones that hit India, there also the role of mangroves uh, has come out very clearly as something that is very positive and um, that is what uh, is helping uh, the, the ecosystem and the ecosystem services around. We are aware that Sundarbans is one of the globally important mangrove regions. And of course, there are other areas, Bhidar Kanika, Gulf of Kutch, Koringa, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, another very interesting area with uh, unique mangroves. So these are all very special areas in India, which are, and most of them are now very well conserved. And uh, I think they are contributing immensely to the biodiversity conservation. Uh, we also, in India, we have, uh, we are very happy to uh, share with the audience that while mangroves have been depleting in other parts of the world, in India, it, they have actually marginally increased in cover. So that's another thing to cheer about. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm sure in other countries also, there are efforts in this direction and we, we should be hearing a lot of positive news from other parts of the world as well. Uh, with its high carbon sequestration potential, mangroves are highly regarded as, as one amongst the nature-based solutions for mitigating climate change, which is definitely the biggest 
problem being faced by the world right now. And this has been recognized and emphasized in the recently concluded COP26 as well in Glasgow. So um, over the next three days, I think uh, the views and opinions and knowledge that you will be sharing will definitely take scientific research in conservation of mangroves to, to new uh, levels and new horizons. Uh, I mean, some some I, I wouldn't end before mentioning a few uh, very good examples like the mangrove cell established by the Maharashtra government, Maharashtra Forest Department, which is actually helping a lot in, in recovery of mangroves in Maharashtra state and uh, has already shown a lot of good results. So India can definitely be at uh, one of the leadership positions in mangrove research and uh, in whole of Asia. And of course, it will all be a collaborative effort with all the um, countries which have mangroves and uh, which are all, of course, all of them are interested in conserving mangroves, looking at their great ecosystem value. So I think uh, today's, uh, this three-day conference is definitely going to provide that platform, build bridges and take conservation of mangroves and support through research uh, and take them to new, new levels. And uh, I wish that uh, this uh, is a very, very fruitful uh, three days and it will definitely help in mangrove conservation in a very big way. So once again, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, very important conference today. And I'm delighted to be here and I'm sure all the participants are going to give their best in these three days and take mangrove conservation uh, forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Thank you so much for your very warm uh, and very, I would say, encouraging uh, inaugural address. Uh, we certainly will try to, to follow through and, and uh, make most out of this gathering. Uh, as you rightly said, mangrove ecosystems are magical systems, uh, not just because they have uh, such immense uh, biodiversity value and, and the services they provide, but they are very unique because they are only found in such a small area in the world. So uh, they are magical in a sense that not many people know or see them in their lifetime, but they do get benefited by all the services these mangroves provide. So indeed, uh, I, I resonate your, uh, your thoughts about mangrove ecosystem. So without uh, further ado, I would like to invite our uh, next uh, um, guest, Dr. Ravi Prabhu, who will uh, provide the welcome address. Uh, Dr. Ravi Prabhu is a, a director at C4 ICRA, and uh, his title is, is interesting. He, he, he looks after uh, our uh, innovation, investment, and impacts. So where all the research is making sense. And during his illustrious career, he has engaged in multidisciplinary research and ex action in forested landscape for almost 20 plus years. He was previously senior program officer, forest and climate change with UNEP in Nairobi. And he has led UNEP team that contributed to the UN Red program, uh, which is an important, uh, I would say, piece in main uh, as a catalyst to transform to green economy in many tropical countries. Dr. Ravi Prabhu has served on numerous international initiative and committees, including the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, where he has served on the review and editorial team, and the UN Millennium Project Task Force on Environmental Sustainability. So Dr. Ravi Prabhu brings uh, to us uh, uh, a life of experience and wisdom on these uh, forested landscapes and how uh, conserving them uh, is important and beneficial to the entire globe. So Dr. Ravi Prabhu, floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Rupesh. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to, to everybody online. Uh, I was actually very pleased when Rupesh asked me to, to speak um, uh, here. Uh, and I suspect it was only because I mentioned to him that while I was doing my PhD in the Andamans, uh, every day I had to cross uh, the mangroves um, around Dhaninala in, in Katpat Bay 
and how fascinated I was. So if I hadn't been such a fan of the mangroves, I doubt he would have invited me. Um, so uh, like Dr. Mohan, I'm a lay person, but I like Dr. Mohan as well. I'm a big fan uh, of the mangroves. I'm certainly not going to come here as a lay person and tell you how important uh, mangroves are. You know that, um, and you're going to discuss this over these three days. So I'm really pleased that this workshop is taking place. Um, I think the, the title is very appropriate. We are looking for nature-based solutions. When we take a look at what's happening to agriculture and forestry, particularly agriculture around the world or fisheries, we see um, a global system in crisis. Our food system is in crisis. Just today, um, the, the, um, on, on, we had the um, uh, December 5th as the World Soils Day and FAO put out a report on plastics and microplastics in, in soils. We know this is affecting marine systems. And mangroves are caught between, as it were, a rock and a hard place, between the hinterland, where a lot of these problems originate, and a marine system which is on the point of tipping over. And in fact, in many um, of the um, mangrove areas, we, we have um, the phenomenon uh, of uh, excessive dumping of waste and, and dead zones. So they are both our life support and they are on life support. So I really do look forward to hearing what kinds of solutions um, you propose. To me, this is uh, something that again requires us as researchers to provide the evidence for policy change because only through evidence and uh, can we start um, looking at systemic change. And that has to be our focus because you are not going to solve the mangrove problem by planting more mangroves or dealing with one aspect of it. It is going to require systemic change. So not just within the mangroves, but the pressures that drive change from outside that apply to mangroves. So I would encourage you to keep your view large even as you drill down on particular areas of expertise. And this zooming in and zooming out um, is a skill set that we as researchers have not really been taught in our universities. We've always been taught to focus in and continue to focus in until we solve the problem. The problem with that is you solve one problem, but you ignore a host of others. So it is particularly pleasing that I see that we have a wide variety of different kinds of um, researchers and thinkers at this uh, workshop so that we can try and connect bits of disparate knowledge to get a better understanding of the levers of change that we need within the system and without the system that are acting on the system from outside. So we need um, nature-based solutions because we cannot continue with high input um, uh, solutions because all of them inevitably call on um, excessive use of fossil fuels or materials that are persistent um, in nature and cause problems. From a C4 aircraft perspective, we are relatively uh, newcomers, particularly in the subcontinent, um, to this issue. So um, I, I really want to congratulate Rupesh for being the flag bearer here. Um, and our recent work in uh, uh, Bhitar Kanika and in, in the Andamans um, helps us to start catching up to the uh, amazing work that all of you have been doing uh, and I look forward to hearing about. In Indonesia, where my colleague uh, Daniel Murtiaso has been working, we have a slightly longer um, uh, uh, depth of experience um, in this area. But what this shows me, and, and that is perhaps uh, my closing sentiment here, is that we are not going to solve complex problems on our own. We need partnerships. And if there's one thing that could come out of this workshop, it would be new partnerships for solving problems. Let's ask the right questions together. Let's form the partnerships that seek to find those answers. And let's set our ambitions high. It will require systemic change and it can no longer be enough to solve parts of the problem. I go back to the 2002 tsunami um, and the role that mangroves played in saving um, a number of systems. But I use the tsunami also as a metaphor. On that day in Thailand, uh, not so much in India, but there were lots of tourists and I'm sure many of their children 
were building beautiful sandcastles. And they had expected those sandcastles to, to last the next day so that they could come back and complete them. But they built them on the beach and the tsunami wiped the sandcastles and much, much more away. So that just goes to show that unless we have a perspective that goes beyond average occurrences, we are not going to be able to deal with the shocks that are, we are going to face in the next um, couple of decades. So um, I would uh, urge you to keep complexity science in your, um, uh, on your radar to the, that basically means working at multiple spatial and temporal scales as you try and um, resuscitate, save, um, and improve the productivity um, of the mangrove systems that are so vital, um, as uh, all of you know, and, and as Dr. Mohan um, just outlined. So with that, I wish you a very, very successful conference. I think uh, this is extremely timely uh, and thank you very much once more, uh, Rupesh in particular, for inviting me to say this. It will be my small um, way of um, expressing my awe of um, the incredible teeming life that I, I witnessed every day from uh, uh, during 1990, 1989 to 1990 as a walk through uh, the mangroves of Thaninala. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Prabhu. This was incredible. You, you again painted the picture of the Ninala. And as you know, just recently I was with Dr. Nehru and I crossed that Danilala. I'm not sure whether you saw the same uh, beauty. I believe you had seen much more magnific uh, magnificent strand, but we did see that uh, what was remaining and it was very impressive and touching. So thank you also for uh, giving us your or sharing the wisdom that as researchers, we need to also develop skill to not just zoom in, but also step back and look at the larger picture, because if we have to solve the problems, we need to, to address all aspects of it. So with that, uh, I would like to move on to our uh, uh, next part where we are inviting our next speaker, our keynote speaker for today. Uh, but before I in introduce Dr. Kakuli Banerjee, I'd like to mention for all of our participants who are joining remotely that for their questions and comments, they can use the Q&A box. Uh, that's where uh, we will have uh, a small opportunity five minutes after our keynote address to, to entertain some of the interesting and important questions. For other comments, uh, their uh, impressions, which doesn't really need a, a response, they can use comment box. So we will be very much interested to hear what you have to say. But if this does not require a response, use comment box. If it's a question, then use Q&A box. So with that uh, small bit of uh, housekeeping announcement, uh, let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, it is my great pleasure that uh, Dr. Kakoli Banerjee will be providing first keynote address of this event. She is presently working as an assistant professor and founding head in Department of Biodiversity Conservation of Natural Resources at Central University of Orissa. She has been working this position since almost a decade. Her area of specialization is biodiversity conservation with reference to coastal ecosystems, coastal pollution, climate change and carbon sequestration, aquaculture, coastal zone management, and remote sensing and GIS. So quite a wide variety of skill sets she has. She has been recipient of several awards, including the Women Scientist Award from the Department of Science and Technology Government of India. She has served as project coordinator of Euphrates project under Erasmus Mundus program funded by University of Santiago de Compostela, Spain. She is also not only been a great researcher, but also a, a good educator and guide. She has guided 51 postgraduate students, about 16 MPhil students and three PhD students. Currently four other students are working with her on their research. Uh, more details about her work and, and research career is on our website. To avoid uh, 
delay and moving on to next uh, item. I invite Dr. Kakoli Energy to share his keynote speak on blue carbon stocks in mangrove forest of Eastern India. Thank you so much and over to you, Dr. Kakoli. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rupesh, for this nice introduction. And I welcome all the delegates on the platform today to, on this very important topic. So I'll uh, just share the screen. My, I hopefully it's visible now. Yes, it's yeah. full screen Thank and good to go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So today I'll be discussing, uh, when we are discussing about the nature-based solutions to climate change, I'll be focusing on the blue carbon stocks in the mangrove forests of Eastern India. Now, to begin with, when we are talking about climate change, there is a lot of temperature increase that we, we are already well versed with. It's a 0.9 degree centigrade rise over the period of 140 years. Subsequently, the carbon dioxide levels have also increased 1.5 ppm over the last 60 years. And uh, when we are talking about climate change and the challenges of climate change can be overcome by the storage of carbon over long periods of time and mangroves, are one of those ecosystems which can sequester three to five times more atmospheric carbon dioxide than any other terrestrial forest. And that's the, what uh, uh, just a few previous speakers were talking about. So the productivity of mangroves ranges from 3.7 to 24.1 tons per hectare. That is, uh, that is why, and that too in the let, period of less than 30 years. That, that's the reason why we are focusing on the mangroves today. India is, not a, 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 is also a partner to this, and we have pledged that we are going to reduce 33 to 35% of the emissions by 2030. And with the large population, India is the world's last third, third, third largest emitter of the greenhouse gases. But in 2008, we have already signed an agreement with the National Action Plan on Climate Change, where we have already taken up eight missions and which, under which Agriculture and forests is one of the key components uh, to discuss with. Now, when we are talking about the uh, forestry here, we are focusing on the mangroves. And as we all know that to set up this stage, it's a, a mangrove can be a tree, a shrub, palm, or a ground fern that we all know as per the definition. And owing to its versatility, it is a, 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 a barrier against a, 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 a the storm and cyclonic depressions. It controls erosion, it is a biodiversity reservoir, it has a lot of medicinal properties which are yet to be explored. We are, we are still on the move and it's a source of bioactive substances. It is helpful in the biopurification of the environment. It is also providing alternative livelihood schemes. It's a house of endangered species. And above all, it's a natural library for all of us for the environmental education. Now, owing to this characteristics of its uh, thriving in the tidal uh, cycle, now we have a diurnal cycle here every six hours, and uh, we see that uh, the mangroves remain inside the water for six hours and six hours outside that. Now, because of its uh, special characteristics, we know that the different forms of its, uh, the, of the different diversity exists both for the faunal diversity as well as the floral diversity. And as we have said, this is what happens, what we are just discussing uh, uh, just before, what Dr. Ravi Prabhu was telling that, yes, the tsunamis can wash off. Now, these storm surges which are there, the, the, the normal trees and the uh, sister, the normal uh, uh, vegetation cannot support this, this total storm surge when it comes to happen in the, in the coastal areas. So it is only the mangroves who can resist us from such type of uh, inundations. Now, if you look into the mangrove map of India, you can see that with the coastline of 7515 kilometers, we are, are almost having 6,749 square kilometers of area. And about 60% of those mangroves lie in the eastern coast that is on the Bay of Bengal. And if you see in the world map, we, are, we all know that Southeast Asian countries are one of the leading areas of mangroves in the world. Although mangroves have been divided into two major groups in the Eastern group and the Western group comprising of the, the Eastern half comprising of India, Southeast Asia, Australia, East Africa and Western Pacific and the Western group comprising of West Africa, South and North America and the Caribbean countries. Now, why? Why we are focusing so much on the mangroves? 
it is basically a sink of carbon it is not a single compartment it is the whole ecosystem as such which is sequestering carbon in the in the mangroves in the tidal marshes in the sea grasses in the salt marsh grasses in the in the sediment as well as in the water column so what exactly is happening is the carbon dioxide that is being assimilated or absorbed by the plants in the pho two photosynthesis that is the mangroves there they, it is assimilated and it is stored in the form of uh, carbon and then the leaf litters and detritus which are falling down in the sediment compartment they are adding to the soil organic carbon and there is a continuous interface between the sediment atmosphere sediment water exchange and also the water and atmosphere exchange so this continuous cycling process of the sediment the water body as well as the plant is giving rise to a complete carbon cycling which is a new aspect which we are working right now now the blue carbon initiatives that has already been taken up in 2017 by the iucn has categorically uh, tried to understand this global problem and they are now uh, giving us opportunities to standardize the methods for quantifying this and uh, myself as a partner for uh, us uh, uh, this particular uh, standardization techniques we are now coming up with a manual which will be which will be floated very soon from the us so we are trying to make a common standard for the data collection quality control what are the priority research areas for the carbon dynamics the planning and management guidelines that we need to follow and as well as the pilot projects which should be taken up as we are already discussing in today's forum now if you look into the if you compare the mangrove forest along with the other forest you can see that mangroves tidal marshes and sea grass meadows are the basic contributors that who are actually sequestering carbon to the maximum extent and if you see the proportion you can see that 40% and 60% proportion is there for mangroves that means the sediment the soil organic carbon also plays a major role in sequestering carbon from the atmosphere now this effectiveness of blue carbon has been quantified and it is almost 1030 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent for the which is being absorbed from the atmosphere by the mangroves it is almost 920 tons for the tidal marshes and 520 tons of carbon dioxide for the sea grass meadows so if you see the holistic picture we can understand what is the effectiveness of this to understand this blue carbon storage now the integrated carbon observation system that is the european based uh, pillar for the ghg observation they have also uh, uh, focused on the knowledge supports right now and they are on the verge of uh, making decision of the policy and the decision making for combating climate change and for that we need to have a distributed research just now what dr ravi prabhu was telling that just we need to have high precision long term observations facilitating research to understand carbon cycle and to provide the sufficient information on the greenhouse gas and their present status now when i am talking about of all these uh, uh, we have what we have done we should now focus on the study area where we have been working right now for the last 10 uh, years of my research work in central university of orissa we have been focusing on two major mangroves as the bitterkanika mangrove ecosystem and the mahanadi mangroves where we have the, the lower stretch and here we as we all know that it is supporting 35 different varieties of mangroves now apart from that we have to when we are looking in a holistic picture we have also to concentrate on the water bodies phytoplankton which are the atmospheric sink of carbon dioxide providing almost 40% of oxygen to the atmosphere it is 30 to 50 billion metric tons of carbon that is being fixed by these micro algae now this is often overlooked we are not taken into consideration to that much extent of working with the phytoplankton which are also the important component of the clean development mechanism and has and has a very good efficiency in absorbing nutrients 
Now, these are some of the pictures of the phytoplankton that we have identified, and you can find there in almost all the uh, all the water bodies in and around our Indian coast. And out of that, you have you will be uh, you will you will be knowing that Coccinodiscus. This is only species which is acting as an indicator species for any pollution levels that we have already identified and have come up with some uh, publications as well. Now we also have tried to understand what is the amount of carbon in those phytoplankton and uh, by the standard formula we have tried to understand the uh, amount of carbon that is present in the different uh, plankton cells and because they are unicellular we need to enumerate singly and then we have to uh, understand it on its volumetric on, on its volumetric aspect. Now, not only that, we also have mangrove associates, the seaweeds, which are edible in character, and they have a lot many other uh, biochemical properties apart from that. If you are concentrating only on the carbon aspect, we have fo focused on the three important species, Entomorpha, Catenella, and Ulva. And out of this, Entomorpha interstellis have been found to store maximum amount of carbon with 1100 almost approximately grams per square meters, although they are where they are sessile in nature, they are found only on the substratum, but yet these are uh, widely uh, uh, usable and you might, and some of my researchers are also carrying out some new products formulation from these CVs, which is not yet uh, into a commercial market in India. Of course, to some extent we have it in Southeast Asian countries and Western countries too. Now, Apart from that, we have the Potricia quarter, the salt marsh grass, where here also we have estimated the carbon, which is which has varied from 0.8 to 1.7 megagram per hectare. So it is, I mean, we need to see that if you, if you see that every compartment of the, uh, of the floral community in mangrove ecosystem are sequestering carbon. This is that we have gone for the mangroves. So we have uh, taken up uh, the mangrove for the as per standard protocols. We have measured the uh, biomass of the mangroves. We have estimated the carbon in the field. Apart from that, the very important factor is what is the ambient environment? The mangroves cannot grow anywhere and any, everywhere with it because it varies with the substratum characteristics. Every species has its own characteristics to survive. For that, we have taken the soil and water parameters uh, with, uh, with respect to pH or salinity, organic carbon texture, as well as bulk density. So, and then why? Why we are into so much of the sediment? Because they are the basic inputs to the fertilization of the water. Because when the outwelling comes the, from the adjacent land masses, they fertilizes the water because of which we have a lot amount of fisheries. And that is the basic background for the productivity of the, of the water bodies. Apart from that, we have the crabs on the sediment compartment, which are actually the detritivores. And through that, we all know that through this food chain, it is reaching, this carbon is reaching to the highest tire, that is the Sundarban, the tigers that we are having only in Sundarbans, which is the largest mangrove reservoir of having the Royal Bengal tigers. So here, the tigers have a very different aspect of their own because they are feeding basically, apart from the wild boars and deers, they feed on these crabs and fishes because of which they are so unique in characteristics. Now, uh, we have also tried to enumerate the biomass values. Uh, and as I have already mentioned that with the changing characteristics of the uh, freshwater flow, the, uh, the tidal cycle, there is a difference in the, uh, in the biomass values. So if you see the Peter Kanika area, we have got, we have worked with five important mangrove species, Abyssinia marina, Abyssinia officinalis, Exocaria agalocha, Rhizophora mucronata, and Xylocarpus granatum, which are the most dominant species as we have recorded with this relative abundance. And in that you have seen that in the, the in the first case in Bitter Kanika, we are getting the uh, the uh, the Avicenia officialis biomass to be extra higher highest in comparison to the other species. Whereas in Mahanadi mangrove belt, which is a little bit more saline area, we are getting the rise of a dominance. But overall, if you see the lower graphs, you can see that the Exocaria agalocha, which has a wide adaptability to the uh, to the changing salinity environment, you have the maximum amount of uh, the biomass or in the exocaria galocha. 
Now, apart from that, when we are talking about the water component, component the mangroves play a major role in, in regulating the pH of the water body. As we all know that the more amount of dissolved inorganic carbon increases in the water body, we have the water, we are, the water pH decreases. On the other hand, it has a positive relationship, the soil organic carbon has a positive relationship with the dissolved inorganic carbon that we have studied. We have also studied to, uh, the, the above ground biomass as well as the above ground carbon and we have calculated the carbon sequestration potential and uh, which is almost around uh, for 550, 47 in the Bitter Kanika and 363 uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. But comparing the whole of Orissa and uh, taking an average mean carbon of 124 tons per hectare, we have calculated that almost 64.8 teragram of carbon dioxide is being absorbed by these unique vegetations in the coastal state of Orissa. We have also tried to develop some regression models and we have come out with 24 linear regression models and 120 non-linear regression models where we have found out that every uh, every uh, tree, I mean, the, all the five species that we have worked on has shown different type of equations for which it is it is very clear that and we have this time for the first time we have done not only taking the biotic parameters, but also the abiotic parameters into consideration when we are talking about how much influence it is occurring for the biomass and carbon for both the ecosystems. So this is how we have found out that it is very, very, very site specific. Now, when we are talking holistically on the, on the carbon, we have to think of that there is also a huge mangrove loss due to degradation. And it's being said that if mangrove deforestation is going on, it will account for 3 to 19% of carbon emissions. And apart from that, we need to, so we need to focus on rightly on the three blue carbon ecosystems that we, I have just discussed, which is, uh, which, which needs to be conserved. And for this, we have done the land use land cover uh, mapping of the Bitar Kanika mangroves. And there we have come out that uh, in, in, the, in the last 10 years, what we have uh, found out is the crop lands are increasing in, in comparison to the dense forests. So this is an alarming picture because people, the livelihood patterns, just now what Dr. Rabi Prabhu was telling, we need to look into the livelihood patterns. People are now moving their livelihood from the, they are uh, from agriculture to the cropping pattern they are cutting down forests for the for getting agricultural land but of course when and these are the red patches which we have marked out you can see that these are the areas where we had almost 6 square kilometers of decrease in the area of uh, for uh, of the, the forests are I mean, total forest comparing all the types of uh, forest that is present in the Bitter Kanika, not only the dense ones but also the moderate forest, open scrub forests, and as, as well the other areas. So we have categorized again the vegetation cover as such separately. And we have come out that the dense forest patch is remaining unchanged, but over the last 10 years, but the, there, is, and there is some increase of 0.06% increase by in the year 2017 that we are seeing. To some extent, we have increased. Now, this may be because of the too much of patrolling that is being done for the fuel wood cutting as well as the increased afforestation program that is being taken up by the, uh, the, the forest department. But above all, here we have taken into consideration all sorts of forests uh, to, to, in order to understand what is the proportion of the mangroves that is, being, is now present in the area. Not only that, we have also taken into consideration the shoreline changes. As you know, that Orissa is very much prone to cyclones. And we are one of the hub of cyclones for every year we have almost two cyclones. So we have tried to understand the, uh, the shoreline changes. And as you can see that the shoreline on the southern part of the coast of Orissa, there is a particularly the Vitar Kanika site, there we have the Gahirmata Wildlife Sanctuary where we have the turtle nestings. And India is, is a, I mean, Orissa is a, having a signature species in turtle, olive ridley turtle nestings. And this particular sanctuary, we are losing the grounds. It is almost 211 meters of recession, which has already occurred in this particular area. So if you see the transaction gra graph, you can see this is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, erosion that is taking place in the, in the Bitter Kanika areas in, in the southern part rather than in the northern part of the sanctuary. So coming to the scope of future, 
we need to have some you no know, more studies on the carbon dynamics extremely important for controlling carbon dioxide concentration we need to know because these are all the gap areas where we have not yet worked on the isotopic fractionation of the carbon should be done for the decomposed soil organic matter which is uh, recognized uh, for the variety of ecosystems and is providing the insights for the physical and biological processes which is mediating the carbon storage and the nutrient availability also the carbon isotopic study is needed to understand the dynamics of carbon cycle and for the development of any type of models we need to uh, uh, develop models specifically with respect to space and to respect with the substratum characteristics these are some of the uh, publications that we have already done in this this is only for the new researchers who want to and we have come up with two important books from csir and hindustan publishing house for the recent developments and environmental coast guards these are the two major books you can have a look on that and uh, lastly i would like to thank the organizers for inviting me for this webinar i'd like to thank the ministry of earth sciences government of india institute of forest biodiversity hyderabad university grants commission new delhi and principal chief conservator of forests for their financial and infrastructural help and support that they have provided for making this uh, this research a success so thank you all i hope i am on time dr rupesh and over to you for the questions yeah thank you dr banerji this was a very comprehensive and detailed presentation and such is the case with the uh, with the keynote uh, speaker that you are facing a challenge of covering a wide topic in a short duration and you did great so thank you all uh, we will take one question um, if you can respond to that briefly and then we will move on because since we have maintained good time let's let's continue this so yeah. the question is by dr vidya r shankar and uh, the question is is there any measure to look at the carbon using mangroves permanently without entering into the ecosystem so i think they are trying to see that is there a way of remotely sensing the carbon stores in mangroves uh, yeah. You, you... yeah this is a very new aspect that we are uh, that isro has already uh, offered me for this so uh, actually the thing is uh, it's it's you cannot lock the carbon using mangroves that what he has she has written is uh, is a measure to lock the carbon using mangroves permanently nothing in this universe is uh, is permanent it is a cycle that will carry on it will it will continue to have so we cannot lock but one thing we can do is do, to if you manage the land use land cover of the of the area and keeping the forest intact if you can provide the alternative livelihood schemes that is the only way where we can we can save the mangroves otherwise it's very difficult in in the way you are asking we cannot lock the system yes from remotely sensed you can do the ndvi vegetation from the remote sensing images you can work with the uh, edas imagine uh, software to find out what is the productivity level but of course with a uh, ground truth verification you always need to do that and apart from that right now no soil carbon uh, carbon mapping has been done in this particular area and uh, of course there is a new aspect is that with the changing environment because as such orissa is having lot of in the cyclones so with the change with the cyclonic effect what is the change in the mangroves how much of the sequestration capacity they are losing or what is their growth effects that need to be understood in that in the in the in the present uh, domain so that is very important uh, that you should uh, look for but we cannot lock carbon as you are uh, saying i mean it is a normal process of uh, cycling thank you dr kakuli banerji and my apologies for reading it wrong so yeah, one no, more yeah i know no i i just read it in the question answer to box yeah so one more uh, thing that this workshop brought out is that my eyesight needs to be tested <laughs> and and i need new prescription so another learning well uh, thank you again for such a, a insightful and detailed talk and there are other questions i i hope we will get some chance to touch uh, during our discussion session yeah. so moving on to our next uh item we we will have a quick group photo our uh, technical uh, uh, lead vito is ready to take a picture of the panel members i request everyone to turn on their video momentarily and uh, uh, come up with a mangrove smile so that we can take a picture and then we'll uh, go to our uh, next speaker uh, vito over to you
you let us know when to smile. Yes, thank you, Rupesh. That's a good idea. Let's see. Let's see. Mangrove. Is that a smile? I think it's going to be a smile. Okay, everybody open the cam. So yeah, I think uh, right now in the count of in the count of two, let's say mangrove first and after that cheese. Mangrove cheese. Is there any cheese mangrove? Probably later on. Okay, one, two, go. Smile. And then that's it. Thank you. Back to you, Rupesh. Thank you very much, Vito. Uh, okay, so uh, after our first keynote speaker, we have uh, the first talk of our session. This talk is about uh, mangrove carbon stocks from island perspective. We have heard about Andaman Nicobar Islands a couple of times already in this session. And uh, this is a great pleasure to invite Dr. P. Raghavan who has conducted his PhD research in these very islands uh, quite recently. So like uh, Dr. Ravi was mentioning sometime about 20 years ago or even longer, uh, Dr. <coughs> Raghavan can, can present and share information from much recent times. So before I pass on the floor to Dr. Raghavan, I'd like to, uh, to provide a brief introduction. He is a scientist in MOEF, Ministry of Environment and Forestry and Climate Change, Government of India, based in New Delhi. He pursued his PhD in marine biology from Pondicherry University. And his area of interest is taxonomy, ecology, molecular phylogenetics, and biogeochemistry of mangroves and seagrasses. So very apt for this session. His more recent research has concentrated on conservation and management of mangroves and carbon dynamics in blue carbon habitats of India, as well, and, and he has worked on eDNA metabarcoding of mangroves. He has published many research articles, more than 40, had eight book chapters and one book. So he, he brings us a very, uh, I would say, experienced vision of mangroves from uh, Andamans, and I pass on this, the floor to him. Over to you, Dr. Ragwan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rupesh. Uh, is my slides are visible? Yes. Can you make them on the full screen mode? Yeah. Yes. Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all. Good morning to all. Uh, today I'm going to share my work experience, uh, uh, which I gathered uh, at uh, gathered from Andaman Nicobar Islands uh, on uh, estimation of uh, ecosystem carbon stock of Andaman Islands. Uh, uh, this work uh, I have uh, funded by the uh, Department of Space as a postdoctoral fellowship at the Physical Research Laboratory under the mentorship of uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar. So. Before going uh, to my research findings and other things, I would like to brief about what is blue carbon, why we have to study the blue carbons, how these blue carbon ecosystems are very much important for developing countries like India. Uh, so blue carbon as definition is very simple, uh, organic carbon that is captured and stored by the oceans as well as the coastal ecosystem, particularly this vegetated coastal ecosystem is called as blue carbons. So the blue carbon uh, vegetated coastal ecosystem means the yeah, prominent is mangroves, seagrass, and salt marsh. Uh, so even though the blue carbon uh, definitions includes oceans, in recent times, even IPCC and in all the uh, climate change uh, treaties and uh, uh, efforts, these coastal vegetated uh, habitats, uh, habitats are uh, highlighted in the recent time. The reason behind is, even though these ecosystems are uh, very, they, they are very small in terms of area, their, uh, their carbon stock potential, highest carbon stock uh, per unit area, and uh, they have a high carbon accumulation rate. So for example, if you see the carbon burial rate is 20 times higher than the other terrestrial ecosystems. In addition to that, they are offering multiple other benefits, not only the carbon sequestration, they are offering many uh, other uh, multiple uh, other co-benefits uh, co like coastal production, water filtration, and uh, livelihoods, nearly uh, 120 million people living near the mangrove areas. And they are, uh, their annual ecosystem service in terms of monetary values goes 
33,000 to 57,000 US dollar. When you look at this is the, some of the comparison graphs. Uh, uh, if you see uh, the total ecosystem carbon stack of mangroves is around 1,000 nanograms of carbon per hectare. When you compare with other ecosystems, it is very less. The same with the carbon burial rate. Carbon burial rate also, it is much higher in blue carbon ecosystems than the other terrestrial ecosystems, as well as these ecosystem services in terms of monetary values uh, as, is also much higher than the other ecosystems. So coming to mangroves, uh, since my research area is on mangroves, I just give a brief about the mangroves. You know very well that mangroves are specialized plants. Uh, they are growing in tropical and subtropical coast. Their total area is around 140,000 square kilometer and they are in 118 countries. And the global uh, true mangrove species in the global mangroves is 84. Uh, the threshold limit is uh, sea surface uh, temperature at least at 20 degrees Celsius. Here you can see some of the peculiar adaptive features of the mangroves. So even though the blue carbon habitats are uh, having the potential to store more carbon, they are the source of uh, greenhouse gas emission too if these ecosystems are not properly handled or if the ecosystems are witnessing degradation. So this is uh, this part is, uh, so this ecosystem have the potential to act as a sink as well as the source. So we have to manage this ecosystem in a proper way. The, the current situation with the current uh, degradation rate of mangroves is 0.2%. Uh, I, I can say this is a good sign when you compare the uh, 10 decade before the rate is around 1 to 1.2%. Now the degradation rate is decreased. So the carbon stocks are disappearing at the rate of 1.8% per year. Uh, between 1996 uh, to 2016, at least uh, we lost 158.4 million tons, which is equivalent to five, around 600 million tons of carbon dioxide. Particularly when the recently the global emission of greenhouse gas from the mangrove loss is quantified, and they have projected that the, the, the coast of Bay of Bengal and Andaman Sea are hotspots for uh, global mangrove loss as well as the emission of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission, emission of greenhouse gases. These are all the average, uh, global average uh, greenhouse gas emission from the uh, mangrove sediments if they are witnessing degradation. So, and, and again, the mangroves are, uh, even though the mangroves are distributed in tropical and subtropical coast, they are, uh, uh, they are most effective uh, uh, natural based solution at the country level rather than the global level. The main reason is there, uh, the restricted distribution uh, throughout the globe. So if, if any country which having a mango blue carbon ecosystem, if they want to use this ecosystem for climate change mitigation as well as adaptation measures, they have to understand the, um, they, they understand the uh, entire carbon, all the component of the carbon cycle, as well as the proper estimation of the each and every component of the uh, carbon cycle of this ecosystem is highly imperative to applying this ecosystem as a natural based solution. So coming to India, India is uh, one country which have uh, all the three blue carbon ecosystems. However, um, mangroves are most prominent blue carbon ecosystem along the Indian coast, uh, uh, followed by seagrass and the salt mosses. But seagrass and the salt mosses are uh, recent times only get much attention uh, in terms of the climate change. And now the policies are uh, making for the better conservation and management of seagrass and salt mosses in India. Uh, in mangroves, uh, the total area of uh, mangrove cover in uh, uh, India is, as per FSA data, it is 4,975 uh, 4, square kilometer and it has 46 true mangrove species, whereas seagrasses, it is around 500 square kilometer and it consists of 15 species. Uh, salt marsh, it is 400 square kilometer and it has 14 uh, mangrove species. However, the carbon storage potential of Indian blue carbon ecosystems are rarely been uh, studied and it is in an uh, infant stage only. So uh, uh, after realizing this uh, potential of uh, these ecosystems, you may know that many countries are included that the national uh, in, in, in their NDCs. The NDCs means it is the like national determined contribution. That is the efforts and the, uh, contribution taken by the country to mitigate the uh, climate change as per the Paris, Paris Agreement. Uh, so far, 28 countries uh, included uh, these ecosystems for mitigation and 59 countries included uh, this ecosystem for adaptation strategies. 
uh, in india included this as a for adaptation not a mitigation measures so blue carbon inventory so e even though these ecosystems are potential for carbon sure how this uh, carbon uh, has uh, need to be estimated for this ipcc has given uh, three tier methods the tier one is it is based on the uh, global average values the uncertainty level is high more than 50 to 90 percent the tier two is assessment based on the uh, average value of the different ecosystem in the particular country here you can get the uh, you can avoid the uncertainty level to, uh, to minimize the uncertainty level but the tier three this is the highly recommended uh, method for carbon uh, carbon accounting in, in a country in a country or regional wise but it is uh, highly uh, cost effective one at the same time it includes uh, more, much more collaboration much more collaboration to make a more site specific and more site specific estimation of the carbon uh, stocks so this is the recent uh, third biennial updates uh, report submitted to uh, united nation uh, in terms of uh, climate change so even though india is a la india is the third largest uh, uh, greenhouse gas emitter if you look at the per capita uh, per capita uh, greenhouse gas emission is around 1.96 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent which is uh, lesser than the global average that is 6.5 tons of carbon dioxide and it is much lesser than the other developed countries so even the i, I can say that uh, the still the low like uh, low carbon lifestyle in india is the major contributing factor for this and uh, and another factor is uh, uh, so far uh, india uh, the uh, emission intensity of india's gdp has reduced uh, by 24 percent between 2005 to 2016. so this is the uh, this clearly shows that uh, uh, how effective we are uh, how effective we are and how our uh, natural resources are play a major role in mitigating the global cl climate change so these are all the methodologies even though our systems are helping uh, in uh, mitigating the global climate change still we have uh, many research gaps when you look at the methodology the greenhouse gas emission from the wetlands and the other lands these are all there is a no data data are available for the greenhouse gas emission from the wetlands and the other lands in, uh, in, 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 in indian subcontinent so these needs to be quantified and then only we can give the very clear picture about our uh, uh, blue carbon ecosystem in countries uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation so to addressing this uh, research gaps uh, as uh, I have, we have carried out the study at andamans uh, uh, to estimate the ecosystem carbon stock of uh, ecosystem carbon stock of mangroves uh, so in this study i have measured uh, two components uh, vegetation carbon and soil organic carbon uh, still because these two com uh, two components are the major uh, representing the major ecosystem carbon for vegetation vegetation carbon estimation i have covered uh, i have covered 41 43 sites in andaman islands and by all of, i have used followed anthropometric method for soil organic carbon stock estimation i have covered only south andaman island uh, so far south andaman island uh, nearly 380 soil samples were analyzed for for this and at the same time we have estimated the how uh, this soil carbon stock is differ between the different environmental setting as well as the within the system so this is the sampling strategy to assess the within system uh, uh, soil organic carbon variability we have collected the samples in three different areas one is fringe and interior and deep interior fringe means it is very close to the we can say very close to the mouth and deep interior it is more than 100 meter uh, 100 meter from the mouth of the uh, mouth of the creek and deep interior means it is more than 200 meter uh, from the mouth of the creek so this is the assurance type uh, this is the assurance setting assurance setting means uh, it has uh, some uh, permanent uh, stream. The freshwater input will be there. You can see in this permanent, and there will be some prominent creeks are present in this area. Whereas this is the coast uh, open open coast type. Here the mangroves are directly fringing the coast, so these mangroves are directly exposed to uh, waves and tides. Here the sampling strategy is like that: fringe interior and the landward fringe, as well as the landward mudflat. So this is the vegetation carbon stock uh, uh, results. If you see the vegetation carbon stock, the mean above ground biomass is around 470 megagram per hectare. The above ground carbon vegetation carbon is 225 megagram per hectare. The whereas in below ground carbon, it is 65.04 uh, 65 uh, megagram. 
director. When you compare the island wise, you can see Little Andaman is having uh, uh, higher uh, vegetation carbon stack than the other islands. When you look at the species wise, you can you know, see the, the dominant species of the Rhizopora mucronata, Rhizopora epiculata, and the Brugiria gymnorhiza. They have contributing a major contribution. Uh, in this, you can see the Sonoracea griffithi. Sonoracea griffithi is one of the critically endangered mangrove species, but this species is contributing more uh, uh, fifth place in contributing the total vegetation carbon. So the main reason is the Sonoracea griffithi is a very gigantic tree. The, even the diameter of the a single tree, most of the trees available in Andaman is a mature, very, very mature trees. Uh, their diameter is goes more than uh, 400 to 600 centimeter. So that is, uh, they have representing uh, higher, higher basal area. So that will reflect the high carbon, vegetation carbon stock in mangroves of uh, Andamans. So this is the, 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 the comparison of Andaman mangroves with the vegetation carbon with other mangroves. When you look at that, the Andaman mangroves are having uh, I can say it is more than double the amount of carbon in terms of even above ground as well as the below ground. So coming to the soil organic carbon stack, the mean soil organic carbon stack is around 331 megagram per hectare. Soil organic carbon content is 3.94 percentage and the density, the carbon density is 40.23 kilogram per meter cube and the carbon accumulation rate carbon accumulation rate is uh, 112.64 gram of carbon per meter square per year. Uh, so when you compare the, uh, the uh, different environmental settings, HRN mangroves and marine mangroves, both are having almost similar uh, uh, soil organic carbon stock. Uh, the main reason is even though the different, even though in Andamans, uh, uh, different environmental settings are there, there is a no perennial rivers, like, perennial rivers are absent in Andamans. So there is a no continuous freshwater inflow uh, in those in these areas other than rain. So that's why even though two different environmental settings, they behave like a same. That is the main reason these two uh, environmental settings are having a similar organic carbon stock. Here you can see the comparison. This is the average value of uh, comparing all the studies. Here also you can see the soil organic carbon stock is again more than double the amount of other uh, uh, mangrove habitats of India. So this is the uh, detailed comparison. Here you can see the, uh, even though the uh, Andaman mangroves are having more uh, soil organic carbon stock than the other studies, I, uh, I can say that the main reason is the, the soil core depth. It is not uniform. It is very from uh, surface to 100 uh, centimeter. If you take a 100 centimeter, then you will probably get a more value. If you take only 10 centimeter studies, you'll get a very minimum value. So we have to standardize these uh, methods. Once we standardize this method, then only we can say, then only we can give the actual picture of the carbon uh, stock in the Indian uh, mangrove habitats. So this is the uh, entire ecosystem carbon stock. When you come to the entire ecosystem carbon stock in South Andaman only, it is uh, around 545 megagram per hectare, which is equivalent to around 2000 megagram of carbon dioxide. So the South Andaman mangroves, the, the present South Andaman mangroves are uh, storing the carbon storing potential, that is vulnerability, vulnerability potential is uh, 200, 2000 megagram of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent. So if we disturbed any, each and every hectare, uh, hectare of uh, uh, South, South Andaman mangroves, then they have, they have the potential to emit around 2000 megagram of carbon dioxide. So in that way, each and every hectare of mangroves is very essential. We have to preserve the degradation of the already existing mangroves. This is more important. At the same time, these existing mangroves have the potential of sequestering the carbon at the rate of uh, 0.17 megagram of carbon per hectare. This is the mitigation potential. So whenever we are going for a blue carbon uh, uh, storage, there is a two component. One is uh, the carbon which is already available and one is the carbon which is uh, sequestered every year. So this is uh, more important. We have to assess the both things. So in a, in a overall representation in uh, South Andaman, as usual, the soil, soil of South Andaman mangroves are representing 61% of the carbon, followed by above ground bioma, above ground carbon and below ground carbon. So these are all the uh, within system variability, how the within the system uh, uh, the uh, soil organic carbon stock is different. Even though the Andaman, uh, whole Andaman and Nicobar Island is comes under the same climatic condition, we can find different variation between the environmental, uh, 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 different variation in the carbon stock with reference to the uh, micro topographical changes and the tidal fluctuation and other things. When you look at the estuarine and the marine mangroves, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, their soil organic carbon stock is almost similar whereas uh, even the uh, carbon accumulation rate is almost similar when you when you see this uh, uh, between within the site the estuarian fringe and the estuarian interior interior mangroves are having Estuarian mangroves are have estuarian interior mangroves are having more carbon stock than the estuarian fringe and uh, estuarian fringe. Similarly, the marine interior mangroves are having uh, more carbon stock than the marine fringe. The same way, the carbon accumulation rate is also different. When you look at the uh, delta C13 value, which gives the source, what is the source of the organic carbon in the uh, soil? Whether it is completely autochthonous or allochthonous. Allochthonous means it is a carbon which is carried from the uh, other sources, other terrestrial carbon or, or as well as the marine carbon. When you look at the estuarine fringe position, it is very from the depth, it's not much very with the depth. But when you see the landward mud flat, here you can see the delta C13 value vary from minus 25 to minus 28. Since minus 25 is a signature of a marine or a, a terrestrial uh, input, the minus 20, minus 28 per mil, which indicates that uh, this land landward mudflat areas might be there, uh, might be colonized by the mangroves in the past, and it has witnessed the degradation in the recent time. So not only uh, beyond the uh, burial, uh, mangroves are uh, contributing a major source for uh, the major source for major source of dissolved organic carbon as well as the particulate organic carbon and dissolved inorganic carbon. This particularly the dissolved inorganic carbon represents more than 52% of the uh, net primary productivity in mangroves. So the, the burial represents only, mini, only a very, uh, very uh, minimum portion of the total uh, uh, net primary productivity of the mangroves. So we have to understand the lateral export of these other carbon uh, fractions to understand the, entire, understand the whole carbon uh, storing potential of the uh, ecosystems. So in, in case of mangroves, you just see the burial represents only 14% percentage of global carbon burial, whereas DIC exports represent 28% of the global export and DOC represents 13% POC is not yet known. The data are very minimum. So we have to understand each and every component of the uh, every component of the carbon cycle in blue carbon ecosystem to uh, use of this ecosystem for climate change mitigation of any countries. So last but not least, ecology is the permanent economy as said by the Sundarlal Bhaguna, uh, the leader of Chipko movement. So instead of uh, standing against the nature, it is, better than, it is better to go along the nature. So we have to choose the go along the nature or uh, uh, this photograph shows along the nature, this photograph shows against the nature. So we have to choose. So it is in the hands of all the citizens, all the citizens of the countries, those countries are uh, uh, consist of this blue carbon ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raghavan. Thank you for, uh, again, a very thorough presentation, sharing with us uh, also the global perspectives in terms of uh, uh, mangroves and blue carbon um, capability of storing, sequestering carbon, as well as storing carbon. And also then uh, drilling down deeper on the uh, Andaman islands perspective. It is very good to see the research you have conducted in terms of putting the value, how much of carbon is stored per unit hectare yes. and what is uh, under, uh, you know, severe risk if these areas are degraded because very often policy makers or decision makers uh, require these kind of number hard facts uh, while making this uh, decisions in terms of whether a particular area of mangrove has to be converted uh, into some other land use type, what is at stake. So this kind of research is very prominent. And I just want to, to remind uh, all of our uh, uh, attendees that today's focus, since it's uh, uh, today's uh, theme for uh, is on uh, uh, blue carbon ecosystem and nature-based uh, solutions for climate change, we are focusing on the climate mitigation and sequestration kind of aspects. But tomorrow we will be uh, discussing more on the adaptation side of things where topics like uh, biodiversity conservation, coastal resilience, and uh, socioeconomic aspects will be discussed more. So it's not that uh, we are not talking about the importance, but today's theme is more on the 
uh, the carbon. That's why most of the talks are on that. So we have uh, sort of run out of time. Uh, there are a few questions in the, in the Q&A box. I will encourage all speakers as well as panel members try to answer them uh, by typing if it is possible, we can always take them again in our discussion section, but uh, we will like to take a short break now. Uh, we are already four minutes into that break time, but we will reconvene again at 11 a.m. India time, which is about six minutes. During this time, Vito will play some short videos which are interesting and informative. So please, uh, We'll see them if you can. Otherwise, take a break, uh, grab up a cup of coffee or water or uh, uh, stand up, stretch your legs. But we'll meet again at 11 sharp for rest of the program. Thank you. Uh, we start our uh, part two of today's session. Uh, we had a very productive, very insightful, insightful first session where uh, we had uh, inaugural and welcome address and then a keynote address by Dr. Kakali Banerjee and a talk by P. Raghavan. We'll have one more talk today and then a panel discussion where two presentations and then uh, a lot more discussion and sharing of ideas. So to invite our second uh, speaker today for talk, we have with us Dr. Anirban Akhand, who is a visiting researcher in Coastal Estuarine Environment Research Group Port and Airport Research Institute, Japan. His research interests are carbonate chemistry and carbon cycle, both organic and inorganic in estuaries and coast. And then he has also looked into greenhouse gases in maritime and freshwater systems and blue carbon and coral ecosystem dynamics concerning climate change. So he would be a very good second speaker after the introduction of this topic uh, in earlier part. Dr. Anirban has uh, obtained his PhD from Faculty of Sciences, Jadavpur University, and completed his postdoctoral research in the same school. He, uh, for his postdoctoral research, he joined Port and Airport Research Institute from uh, May 2016 until March 21. He has more than 40 research publications and uh, participated and delivered presentations in various national and international seminars and conferences. Dr. Akhand will be talking today on biogeochemical underpinnings and associated processes in coastal mangrove forests. So a little more sort of a, a, a zoomed in version on different processes that makes these mangrove ecosystems very unique and allows them to sequester carbon. So with that, Dr. Anirban, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhomia. Uh, am I audible? Yes, very clearly. Okay. May I share my screen? Please go ahead. Yes, it's visible. Can you make it to the full screen mode, please? Yeah. Okay, good. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, before beginning my presentation, I would like to thank and express my sincere gratitude to the organizers, especially Dr. Bhumia, for inviting me as a speaker to this marvelous virtual mangrove conference. The topic that I have chosen for today's discussion is biogeochemical underpinnings and associated processes in coastal mangrove forests. Owing to my expertise in carbon biogeochemistry, I would like to focus mainly on underlying processes that drive the carbon biogeochemistry of the mangrove dominated estuarine waters. Most of my works are conducted in the Indian part of Sundarbans. Hence, I would also like to emphasize some unique biogeochemical features of Sundarbans. As we all know that atmospheric CO2 concentration increase is bothering us since the onset of the industrial revolution. And in this regard, environmental scientists are desperately looking for nature-based solutions. Mangrove environments have long been recognized as a net sinks for CO2. However, 
the critical CO2 dynamics within, the, within this ecosystem are still researched with considerable interest. In one of my recent works, we measured PCO2 water, that is partial pressure of carbon dioxide in water with a high temporal resolution automated underwater PCO2 analyzer in the creek and estuarine waters around Dhonchi Islands of Sundarbans. This high temporal resolution measurement enabled us to minimize underestimation or overestimation of PCO2 water because it can efficiently catch the effect of variability of tidal maxima and minima. We subsequently estimated air water CO2 flux in these sampling stations. We found uh, the creek stations are sources of atmospheric CO2 and estuarine stations are sinks for atmospheric CO2. We compared Sundarbans data with mangrove surrounding waters from different parts of the world. And we also found that PCO2 water was significantly lower in mangrove surrounding waters in Sundarbon than in other parts of the world. From, the time, from our time series data, which is the first of its kind in Sundarbans, you can see a distinct tidal trend of PCO2 in the creek stations. High PCO2 was observed during low tide and vice versa because the mangrove pore water and crab burrows are rich in PCO2 and add PCO2 during low tide, whereas marine water reduces PCO2 during high tide. We observed a high DIC value with more deviated delta C13 of DIC. Denitrification was found the main organic matter degradation pathway. Total alkalinity by dissolved inorganic carbon ratio is a metric of carbonate buffering capacity and excess DIC was negatively correlated with total alkalinity by DIC ratio. On the other hand, no significant correlation was found between excess DIC and apparent oxygen utilization. Generally, chlorophyll A and PCO2 are expected to be negatively correlated. However, in this case, both chlorophyll A and turbidity showed a significant positive correlation with PCO2, which indicates biological uptake is not a dominant process in controlling low PCO2. Rather, organic matter degradation contributes to PCO2 water. A similar positive correlation between chlorophyll A and PCO2 was also found by other researchers in other parts of the world. To understand more deeply about the cause of low PCO2 of mangrove surrounding water of Sundarbon, we estimated PCO2 and revel factor of all possible sources of waters in the estuaries and the creeks. Revel factor is a measure of carbon buffering capacity, carbonate buffering capacity in marine water. And we found that the low PCO2 and high carbonate buffering capacity was mainly contributed by offshore water of the Bay of Bengal, which reduces the PCO2 even in the mangrove surrounding creek waters. Here we showed schematically that the CO2 efflux from the mangrove surrounding water was much lower than the recently estimated world average. Uh, uh, recently estimated world average and the main cause is high carbonate buffering capacity water is dominating Sundarbans from the Northern Bay of Bengal. From this study, we hypothesized a resultant hypothesis that is climate change and anthropogenic intervention can alter the riverine freshwater flow and can affect the inorganic and organic carbon dynamics. And we, uh, and we estimated the effects of riverine freshwater reduction on the inorganic and organic carbon dynamics and air water CO2 flux in the mangrove dominated waters. To test this hypothesis, we elaborated our study in the 
হোল মাতলা এস্টুয়ারি অ্যারাউন্ড সুন্দরবন অ্যান্ড ধামরা এস্টুয়ারি অ্যারাউন্ড দ্য ভিতরকনিকা ম্যানগ্রোভ ফরেস্ট ইন এ কম্পারেটিভ অ্যাপ্রোচ অফ স্টাডি উই ফাউন্ড হায়ার স্যালিনিটি লোয়ার পিসিও টু অ্যান্ড হাই টোটাল অ্যালকালিনিটি বাই ডিআইসি রেশিও ইন দ্য মাতলা এস্টুয়ারি দ্যান দ্য ধামরা এস্টুয়ারি we also found that the seasonality of the pathway of organic matter degradation was found less in the matla estuary than in the dhamra in matla the organic matter degradation pathway was found mainly between denitrification and ammonification whereas in dhamra these pathways varied between the aerobic respiration denitrification calcium carbonate dissolution and sulfate reduction this uh, slide shows the 3 n member mixing model using the stable isotopes the 3 n member mixing model of organic matter revealed that the relative contribution of mangroves riverine freshwater and marine end member to particulate organic matter of water was comparable comparable between these two estuaries however mangrove derived organic matter that is blue carbon contribution is significantly higher in sedimentary organic matter in matla than that of the dhamra this might be because of lesser flushing effect due to lack of riverine freshwater higher sedimentation rate or higher uh, mangrove coverage area but it is uh, need to be research more on to confirm this uh, the reason this schematic diagram shows a mangrove dominated estuary with sufficient riverine freshwater supply has low salinity high pco2 low buffering capacity low dic and total alkalinity and high particulate organic carbon and dissolved organic carb carbon whereas mangrove dominated estuary with lack of riverine freshwater has high salinity low pco2 high buffering capacity high dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity whereas low pc uh, particulate organic carbon and dissolved organic carbon hence we concluded that reduced river and fresh water due to climate change and anthropogenic effects might have a positive feedback effect in the mangrove ecosystems which reduced co2 evasion from the mangrove water retention of more dissolved inorganic carbon in the water and storage of more mangrove derived blue carbon in the riverbed sediment mangrove environment and biogeochemistry are interwoven with each other any changes in the mangrove habitat exhibit a clear manifestation in the biogeochemical dynamics of the surroundings mangroves filter out pollutants that are known to us however due to indiscriminate anthropogenic activities mangroves themselves have become active depositors of pollutants coastal uh, coastal eutrophication and the role of mangrove land conversion is one of the active areas of research flourishing all though all through india as a significant trend of mangrove land conversion to aquaculture is noticed lately marine pollution like plastic pollution heavy metal pollution persistent organic compound pollution and, and antibiotic pollution have been and continue to be some of the active fronts of mangrove research in india several anthropogenic activities like dam construction and changes in river runoff and discharge influence the species composition and the overall biogeochemistry of the mangrove adjacent sediment and water column these changes are also widely being studied in india however before ending i would like to stress the fact that more endeavors are required to conserve and restore the mangrove species assemblages in india or else future generation researchers might not be able to see enough mangroves to research upon this critical ecosystem thank you thank you dr nirban you actually wrapped up your uh, talk in, in 
shorter duration than allocated. So this gives us an opportunity to touch upon some of the questions uh, that are uh, coming up in Q&A box. But I must uh, like to thank you that uh, you are present in your presentation, you started off with the, the biogeochemical or the chemistry aspect, the carbonate and, and how uh, changing atmospheric carbon dioxide is affecting the marine life and how blue carbon ecosystem, uh, understanding these processes are important in blue carbon ecosystem. And then you also shared some of the, the emerging or, or the ideas or gaps, what needs to be studied because very often, like we talked, you need to also keep an eye on the big picture in terms of say dam construction, someone somewhere happening in the upper catchment area, maybe yes. reducing the flow of uh, fresh water. And that might have an impact on the mangroves or coastal ecosystem, uh, which might otherwise look very natural. You know, yes. yeah, when you look at that system, you may not see anything different, but the water which was coming from upstream uh, has has been curtailed or has reduced significantly that the, the environmental flows in those streams and rivers are not maintained. And so the, all the biological productivity or all the, the function and structure of that ecosystem is uh, jeopardized. So this is also important. What happens in the in the landscape level uh, affects what happens in the coastal area. So oh, with that, we have still a few more minutes before we go to our next session. So I'll take an opportunity to go through some of the questions which are still open. There's one question which uh, <clears throat> uh, I think Dr. Kakoli Benerji uh, indicated she would like to answer it live and the question is is it possible to grow mangrove plant in nursery um uh, dr cockley uh, would you like to yeah. say uh, yeah because uh, we all know that there are a lot of nurseries being developed by the forest department so obviously it is possible but only thing we have to keep in mind the uh, soil characteristics and the uh, the salinity profile for the uh, for every mangrove because uh, mangroves like heritiera forms nipa fruticans these are some of the species which are freshwater loving so uh, if you have a low salinity i mean one, uh, please zero to two ppg salinity in the starting uh, uh, in the when you are starting the uh, plantation or the seedling at that time it helps them to grow faster but in other cases sometimes uh, the the species which are uh, more saline loving like exocaria or rhizophora one of the questions was there which i have answered in the typological typing uh, mode that uh, these are the species which are high saline loving so for those species you need to maintain the salinity of that soil so this is the and of course it is possible always to grow it in nursery because in Calcutta, uh, in the East Calcutta wetlands, because of the low soil environment, there are some Sundari trees which are being planted and people are practicing this, its uh, culture in their own home gardens because of the low salinity. So it's uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's always possible. Thank you, Dr. Kukuli. And there are other questions about uh, restoration and plantation, but I, I don't want to address them now because one of our panel members will be speaking on this topic and it would be useful to bring those up uh, in discussion later on. Um, then there was, uh, <clears throat> there are really long questions which will take some time to go through. I think maybe these are comments which should be sent in the chat box instead of questions. Um, so oh, we, while we wait for uh, any other question to come up pertaining to the the speakers or, or talks today, I do have one question uh, for Dr. Anirban. Yes. Um, what I, I and I think you you might have touched upon this, but uh, you know mangroves play an important role also for the the corals. You know the water quality benefits that they they provide are important in in uh, for coral sustenance. So yes. to uh, mm, so it's easy to understand the, the role that uh, the mangroves trap the sediments, you know, which are coming yes. from our stream and, and uh, that provide the water quality benefits. Can you speak a little bit about the, the nutrient aspect of it? Like, you know, uh, how they can uh, help in improving the water quality from nutrients perspective? Uh, um, yes, uh, I have worked in the Iriomote Island of uh, Japan and though we have not uh, measured the nutrient, but you, what you are saying that uh, the uh, sediment trapping, 
we have also seen the same thing that because of the mangrove plantation, there is a continuum of mangrove and then seagrass and then corals and mangroves are uh, trapping more and more nutrients and that is uh, also they are trapping the particulate organic matter and so they provide a clean water uh, for the seagrass and the corals and also uh, the mangroves are acting as a refuge for uh, the coral system. I have also seen such kind of uh, papers and for nutrients, uh, I uh, assume that as it is trapping more and more sediments, the mangroves are utilizing more and more nutrients also as well in the water to uh, provide a clean, uh, more cleaner water for the next ecosystem that is seagrass and uh, coral. But at the same time, I think the organic matter degradation is a uh, major part in uh, the biogeochemistry of the mangrove surrounding water. So the, uh, uh, the recycling of the nutrients in the mangroves, whether it is acting as a a lateral source or net lateral sink for nutrients is case specific and uh, it is depending on the ecosystem and many other aspects uh, the uh, where is the mangrove situated of the world that is an also important aspect i think thank you yes it is also uh, important because you know uh, in, in some areas uh, the water, if there are excess nutrients or eutrophication, then there is a growth of microalgae and other, uh, you know, uh, community, yes. which will uh, not allow sea grasses and corals to, to thrive because the light cannot penetrate. So yes. the, just, just to highlight the interconnectedness of this entire ecosystem, you know, uh, how they, they play an important role, even for uh, uh, corals and sea grasses, which are uh, further uh, towards the ocean. Uh, Dr. Kokoli, there is uh, one question uh, which is in chat box uh, where uh, our uh, attendee uh, Nagarajan is asking, is there any way we can quantify the loss of carbon in mangrove ecosystem which is lost due to severe cyclones? Uh, so we can always go for it because uh, for, with cyclonic depressions, you need to you uh, monitor. For, first of all, physically, it's very difficult after the cyclone is over and the post-restoration phase, you can always monitor what is the change in the biomass of the uh, uh, trees because generally what happens in the long run after the cyclones are already there. Uh, the 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 back in the back waters the too much of salinity that ingression the water the tidal water which has ingressed in the land area that keeps on standing so it increases the soil salinity because of which so the growth of the mangroves get stunted in the long run so that post monitoring is very important after the cyclones to understand it physically and uh, through remote sensing images, you can always get a uh, picture on uh, what is the uh, NDVI changes that you are finding or the area changes if you are finding. Now, generally what happens in the, in the, in the near to the shore, uh, you have the seedlings growing up. So those seedlings sometimes get washed off because of the erosion, because the root network system is not so developed in the small trees. So uh, for that reason, uh, it is uh, it is somewhat uh, there some there there are some reports saying that the mangroves get destroyed by the uh, by the cyclones. So it is not that the well developed mangroves will never get destroyed. They are already firm and they have that tensile capacity uh, to bend and again uh, come back to its original position. So uh, it's it, and that is the reason we are uh, proposing mangroves for plantation in the coastal areas. So it is uh, through remote sensing images, you can always go for the man management of how much uh, uh, land area it is reduced. And uh, just like I have already shown in my PowerPoint presentation, the, that way we can do it. And other ways is by physical method, if you can visit after the post-restoration phase. Thank you, Dr. Kokkli. And then <clears throat> this also, <clears throat> sorry, this also highlights the importance of having some, you know, prelim preliminary or baseline survey. So if you have a little bit a better understanding of the uh, mangrove stocks, yeah. 
Yeah, so then you can always relate back and do uh, even with a physical monitoring, then you can capture how much was there earlier and what kind of losses uh, suffered. So that's the other aspect, you know, mangroves are vulnerable uh, or the coastal area is vulnerable uh, because of human or anthropogenic activities. But there are uh, increasingly more and more these severe, uh, you know, natural events. Uh, which are coming with the greater frequency, greater intensity due to climate change. And so the impacts are higher. Yeah. So with that, I think it is a good time to transition to our uh, next part of our program, which is panel discussion. We will have two panel members, uh, Dr. Uh, or Professor Kathiration and Dr. Gurmeet Singh. Uh, they will have a small presentation first. And then we will uh, leave the next half of this uh, panel discussion, sort of open discussions, where all speakers, along with panel members, uh, will be uh, answering questions or will engage in discussion. So this is a total one hour session, and then we'll have uh, concluding remarks. So our first panel member here is uh, Professor Kathy Raisen. Uh, this is a name which I am sure everyone has heard and known his work, so it ne he needs no introduction, but I'll uh, say a few words about him. He is an honorary professor in Annamala University. He was former Dean and Director in Faculty of Marine Sciences in the same university. Dr. Kathy Raisen is among top 2% mangrove scientists and is ranked first in India for marine biology and hydrobiology. So that's uh, our incredible honor that he has made time to join this uh, conference. Two of his research papers on mangroves are among top 10 in the world. And he has undertaken extensive field work in mangroves of India and in 15 other countries. So he has a, a huge experience of not only national mangroves, but also internationally. He has executed about 30 projects guided 40 PhD students and organized over 100 plus training programs, which has benefited participants and members from over 28 countries. He has more than 500 publications, including about 300 research papers, 56 book chapters, and 15 books. So this just speaks volumes about his experience and his uh, uh, lifelong career as a mangrove researcher and educator. So we are very happy to have you here, sir. Uh, the floor is yours. Next slide. Can I have the next slide? Uh, most beautiful mangroves, beautiful introduction. Thanks to Dr. Bomia. Beautiful you know, talks given by Dr. Banerjee, Dr. Raghavan, and Dr. Anirban. And uh, I'm very happy to interact with uh, all the mangroves of this Indian subcontinent. Mangroves are extraordinary, extraordinary in carbon sequestration. And the mangroves are the only blue carbon forest on the earth. And we compared 25-year-old planted mangrove site with the adjoining unplanted barren site. We found the carbon sequestration is 90-fold higher in the soil of the planted site, 9,890-fold greater in both soil and vegetation of the planted site than the unplanted barren site. And the carbon sequestration increased with the soil moisture, silt and clay content of the soil, and increasing level of soil nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, copper, iron, zinc, manganese and magnesium. Carbon sequestration potential reduced with increasing soil temperature, soil salinity, and sand content of the soil. So what we infer is 
carbon sequestration potential can be improved through soil management soil management can i have the next slide mangrove cover is increasing in india during 2011 and 2019 there was an increase of 54 square kilometer of mangrove forest cover in india uh there is a gain in the mangrove cover in maharashtra odisha gujarat and andhra pradesh unfortunately there was a loss of mangrove cover in tamil nadu andaman and west bengal no change in other places of the country we had 6000 kilometer square kilometer mangrove cover during 1960s now it is 4975 square kilometer and uh, therefore we have 1000 square kilometer possibly and there is a greater scope for restoration for boosting the carbon storage if you can see the mangrove cover in india after 2003 there is an increase in the mangrove forest cover overall increase and also they is likely to have 1000 square kilometer in the country uh, there is a scope for restoration of boosting the carbon storage can i have the next slide and in india we have three types of uh, mangrove forest very dense moderately dense and open the very dense uh, mangrove has the canopy density of uh, more than 70% moderately dense mangroves have the canopy density of 40 to 70% the open type of mangrove has the canopy density of less than 40% But if you look at it, very dense mangrove, thirty percent; moderately dense mangrove, thirty percent in the country. Open mangrove type, we have forty percent. Generally, carbon sequestration will be greater in the very dense mangrove forest, followed by moderately dense. But the carbon sequestration will be poor in the open type of mangrove forest. so we have to convert to the open type of mangrove forest in the country so rehabilitation of this open mangroves is necessary to boost up the carbon sequestration potential of this country can i have the next slide see mangroves are degrading already told you 40% are open type the mangroves are degrading mainly because high salinity as a result of high salinity the nutrient availability is reduced when the nutrient availability is reduced automatically beneficial bacterial counts are poor so can we convert the degrading mangroves into luxuriant mangroves by manipulating these adverse conditions by reducing the hypersalinity can we increase nutrient availability and the beneficial bacterial counts the answer is yes it is quite possible next canal bank planting technique this technique is uh, for tidal flushing and uh, rehabilitation of degrading mangroves so fish bone like model the canals are made therefore the tidal flushing is better then uh, the the degrading mangroves can be converted into luxuriant mangroves 
it was demonstrated with the participation of local people by ms swaminathan foundation and forest department can i have the next slide please this participatory effort increased the forest cover by 90% in degraded mangrove areas of pichavaram between 1986 to 2002 this is a success story so what do you infer from this is we need more focus on participatory management of mangroves for increasing the carbon sequestration potential so we need to raise the awareness among the public on the importance of mangroves on climate mitigation potential next slide please even though the canal bank planting technique is successful in some places say for example in this is muttupet area in particular in a, in few areas the mangroves were growing very luxuriant along this uh, dugout canal but after 12 years of luxuriant growth mangroves died why it is due to the siltation of this canal the siltation is because of the lack of free flow of tidal water so therefore the continuous monitoring of the restored mangrove is essential another thing within uh, one decade you can't expect the carbon accumulation to occur in the restored mangroves so the carbon accumulation will be significant only in long term so therefore continuous monitoring of the restored mangrove is essential where the remote sensing with machine learning approaches are very much required for the future can i have the next slide mangrove conservation and management so what i can suggest is the protection should be given the priority the dense mangroves are very efficient in uh, carbon sequestration we need to protect the dense mangroves wherever they are present and wherever we have larger trees with height and diameter that should be protected that should be protected because there is a positive correlation between the tree height and carbon sequestration the diameter tree diameter and carbon sequestration so protection should be of our top priority second is hydrological restoration it should ensure the free flow of water if the soil is not massaged by the tidal water the mangroves will not be happy to grow so therefore the free flow of water should be ensured by hydrological restoration the third option only planting the planting should focus on biodiversity enrichment with the native species all these three practices should be made with the local participation the participatory management requires more attention and focus in this country can i have the next slide connectivity the mangroves are highly interconnected with other coastal ecosystems sea grasses and coral reefs of course not everywhere you can find uh, the mangrove sea grass coral reefs Uh, the best example is gulf of mannar so what we have done is we have compared mangrove sea grass corals sea grass coral intermediate mangrove sea grass intermediate the sea scape approach we made and we analyzed the phytoplankton productivity next slide as uh, kakoli rightly pointed out the phytoplankton productivity is very important 
when we analyzed the phytoplankton productivity gram carbon per meter square per day the productivity was the highest in mangroves lowest uh, you know in coral reef and intermediate in sea grasses in the in the seascape approach so this uh, interconnectivity was observed by us next slide see what uh, we have done is and we understood when the leaves are the litter falling down in the mangroves they are cut by the crabs facilitating microbial decomposition during microbial decomposition the nutrients are released especially nitrogen and phosphorus and nitrogen and phosphorus is essential for phytoplankton productivity so when nitrogen and phosphorus is released by microbial decomposition the nitrogen and phosphorus enhances the phytoplankton productivity and facilitating the carbon sequestration then these nutrients from mangroves are released into the sea grass and coral reef in the seascape naturally the productivity in the sea grass and coral reefs also increased so this interconnectivity needs uh, more focus in future and uh, we have proved this uh, interconnectivity using fatty acids and stable isotope studies can i have the next slide please mangroves are the super stores and they are the super stars as compared to terrestrial forests because mangroves are absorbing a high quantity of atmospheric carbon dioxide and storing it in the form of biomass very efficient in absorbing capturing carbon dioxide in the same way the carbon is stored in the soil for millions of years whereas in other terrestrial forests carbon storage is for a few decades but mangroves carbon storage is for millions and millions of years this is because the most of the the soil domain of mangrove is anaerobic because of this anaerobic condition mangroves are stored efficiently in the mangrove soil for millions and millions of years but very unfortunately in india uh, normally in the terrestrial forest people are focusing only on biomass that to on the above ground biomass uh, and similar to terrestrial forest we are also working on mangroves that is not correct so rather than above ground biomass below ground biomass is very important in the below ground biomass there are enormous fine roots fine roots are developed and therefore uh, we need more focus on the underground carbon sequestration but unfortunately we are collecting samples only in the top most layer of the soil so we should go for the deep soil sampling can i have the next slide please so we need to analyze the soil carbon at least uh, for 1 uh, meter depth of the soil so we have to analyze soil carbon at least 1 meter soil depth and we need to estimate total ecosystem carbon storage that is how much of quantity of carbon stored per unit area and very importantly carbon sequestration and this carbon sequestration is the climate mitigation potential so therefore the carbon sequestration the the estimation is very important and this is the process of removing atmospheric carbon for storage 
per area per unit time. So the carbon sequestration refers to climate mitigation potential. So we need to follow uniform methodology. Of course, Kaufman and Donato we are using, but we have to refine this uh, methodology. A uniform methodology should be followed in this country or Indian subcontinent so that the comparison will be easier. We have to improve the measurement of below ground carbon for the fine roots and sediments. So precise uh, measurement methods should be you know, uh, refined and we need to have some workshops training to the youngsters who are working on carbon sequestration potential. Next. And uh, as rightly pointed out uh, by Dr. Raghavan, this carbon sequestration varies with the type of mangroves, tide dominated, river dominated, and interior mangroves, how they are different in carbon sequestration potential. And uh, very dense mangrove forest, moderately dense forest, and open mangrove forest. In addition, lagoon mangroves, island mangroves, yeshurin mangroves, delta mangroves, like that, you know, different types of mangroves have to be studied because carbon sequestration potential varies with the, the type of mangroves, type of mangroves. Next slide, please. So we need to develop predictive models by using the data set of carbon sequestration, deforestation, grades, and the land use change drivers, land use change drivers for identifying the hotspots of carbon dioxide emission. We have to identify the hotspots of CO2 emission for effective management. Uh, today, there are six global hotspots of carbon dioxide emission due to mangrove loss, due to conversion of uh, conversion to aquaculture, agriculture, urbanization, and natural disasters. Among the six global hotspots of carbon dioxide emission due to mangrove loss, the Bay of Bengal is one. We need more focus on Bay of Bengal. Because even though India mangrove cover is increasing in Tamil Nadu, Andhra, uh, Andaman and West Bengal, the mangrove cover is reducing. We need more focus on Bay of Bengal in future. Next slide, please. You know, the carbon sequestration mostly takes place during winter time. There is a clear cut seasonal variation. During summer, carbon sequestration is minimum, minimum. So the seasonal variations are important. How these physical, chemical, and biological factors are influencing the carbon sequestration potential. We need more research intervention. Plant, mangrove plant species, and Dr. Kakoli was telling, you know, the mangrove plant species varies in carbon stocking in different places. And the same way, microbes, the studies on microbes in mangroves are very limited. What is the role of anaerobic bacteria in the carbon sequestration? We need more focus. What is the role of fauna on carbon sequestration potential of mangroves? We don't have much study. You know the crabs. The crabs are the keystone species of mangroves. They are making burrows, collecting the leaves, and then storing it uh, in the burrows as bank. It's a reserve bank for them. Otherwise, the mangrove litter will be washed away by the tidal water. And the crabs are saving the organic matter in the burrows. So role of fauna in the carbon sequestration, we need more focus and studies. 
Can I have the next slide? It's a very important uh, aspect. I think I am very happy that Anirban pointed out this. The carbon storage capacity reduces when the rainfall is low. When the rainfall is low, when the damp constructions are there, then the obstructions are there, what happened? The fresh water entry from upland to mangrove will be reduced. When the fresh water is reduced and the sediment uh, entry is uh, reduced and the nutrients are reduced, then the mangrove forest will not, uh, will not grow luxuriant. And the mangrove soil will become uh, coarse textured. In the same way, seawater in many of our river mouth is silted, blocked. As a result of the siltation of river mouth, seawater entry or the tidal water flushing is very much reduced. So this uh, connectivity, this uh, hydrological connectivity impact on carbon storing capacity needs more study and focus. Increasing temperature, salinity, tidal amplitude, poor soil texture, and aerobicity, pollution, especially sewage pollution, when they are increasing, then the carbon storing potential will be reduced. So we need to study on these factors. Uh, pertaining to carbon sequestration potential of mangroves. Then you say pollutants. Can I have the next slide? Next slide, please. Professor Kathiration, do hmm. you have many more slides? Uh, it's very interesting discussion and I'll hate to, to stop I will, you. But... I will finish up. I will finish up. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, I told you about sewage discharges. The heavy sewage discharges and disturbances to mangroves are increasing the greenhouse gas emissions. So therefore, we need more quantification, precise quantification on the fluxes of uh, greenhouse uh, gases. Next slide, please. The climate change factors, how the sea level rise, extreme storms, high temperature, high atmospheric carbon dioxide, altered precipitation, will have impact on carbon sequestration. It's very important. We need more studies on this. When the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere increasing, which are the mangrove species which are quite receptive and tolerant, we need more studies. In Mumbai, there is a pest attack on heavy, uh, uh, during heavy rainfall. And in Pichavaram, we have cannabis dieback, dieback disease due to the drought. And we need more focus on climate change factors. Next. And a very recent study says the India has only 4% of mangrove forest cover, that is 189 square kilometer, qualifying for blue carbon financing. But I don't agree with this. What is important today is it is necessary to map and document the mangroves in India for the spatial and temporal variations of carbon storage and sequestration potential in order to build a better picture on the role of mangroves in climate change mitigation. The last slide, can I? Uh, since I was asked to give lecture for, uh, uh, for 10 minutes, then I was asked to extend my talk for uh, 25 minutes, something like that, I am extending it. Otherwise, I would have cut short my talk. This is the last slide, uh, uh, Dr. Bomia. Uh, so be happy and cheerful. The carbon trading market, the carbon trading market is to be developed in this country because the demand for carbon credit is boosting up. Especially the seafood industries should be involved very much in future. The first of all, what we have to do is financially viable mangrove carbon sites have to be identified based on the probability of immediate threats, imminent threats and carbon dioxide emissions. And then what is the extent of this financially viable mangrove carbon sites? So this is based upon the positive net present value. If the net present value is positive, then that area is financially viable. If the net present value is negative, it is not financially viable mangrove carbon site.
so this uh, positive i mean net present value is the return on investment the return on investment is profit minus expenditure the profit is carbon price for 30 year project time frame with the 5% annual price appreciation and the expenditure you know the cost of uh, mangrove uh, establishment and the maintenance cost and uh, the risk adjusted uh, for the non permanence you know 10% uh, is adjusted so like that the return on investment is calculated what is important is the economics uh, for this uh, climate mitigation potential is very much required. Thank you very much for the opportunity given. Thank you, Professor Kathiration. I uh, I'm sorry to to call you on the time, uh, but I think your presentation was very very comprehensive and and very interesting, and I like how you touched upon all aspects, not just the the seascape approach, what affects the mangrove, but also the economy side. If we really are serious about mangroves playing a role as a as a solution to climate change, as a as an important blue carbon ecosystem, I think it is very important that the finance is available. This was one of the resounding uh, message that came out from the COP26 that recently concluded that where is the money uh, for making all these changes? If we need to protect, if we need to conserve these ecosystem for the global good, there has to be finances available. There has to be plans in place where the countries get motivated to protect these areas, not only for their own sake, for their own uh, population, but also for the global climate change. So I'm really glad. And we will touch upon these, these aspects in our discussion after uh, Dr. Gurmeet's presentation. He will have a, a slide presentation uh, on, on this very topic, and then we'll have an open discussion based on questions. So I think Dr. Kathiresh and I will call upon you again to share more of your wisdom and knowledge on these topics in our um, open discussion forum. But let me introduce Dr. Gurmeet, our, our next panel member. Uh, for uh, sharing his uh, presentation. Dr. Kurmit is working as a scientist at the National Center for Sustainable Co Coastal Management. Uh, this is a center under Ministry of Environment and Forest, Government of India. Uh, this center is based in Chennai and he is working or he has been working in the domain of coastal biogeochemistry for the last 15 years. He's completed his PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University and since then he has worked extensively on carbon burial and nutrient dynamics in coastal ecosystem. His current area of interest is blue carbon ecosystem and climate change. And before I pass on to the floor to Dr. Gomit, I would also like to mention that uh, uh, he was my senior at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. So I, I know him from a long time. It is a pleasure to have you here, Dr. Gurmeet. Uh, the floor is yours, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, is it visible? It's visible, but not on the full uh, slideshow mode yet. Okay, okay. Yeah, I will put it on. Uh, yeah, now it's there. Hello? Yeah, not yet, but uh, maybe it's a delay. Um, but I, I still see it in the slides mode, not a slideshow mode. Uh, is it now? Maybe uh, you need to... Um... I will stop sharing and I will reshare it again. Yeah, yeah, that will work, I think. Great. I'll let you know as, as I see. Please yeah, go. just a bit. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Rupesh. Uh, it has been long that uh, we have met. Uh, 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 now coming to my presentation, um, I will uh, address to several of the questions what uh, Dr. Kadiresan has uh, raised. Um, he has uh, raised several of the valid question, uh, really valid question. For example, I will just give you an example. Uh, I was uh, I was listening to the presentation which happened uh, since morning, and uh, in Indian prescript, uh, perspective, there was quite a difference in the total uh, mangrove area cover. One study said that it is a uh, 4,900, another was uh, 
uh, something 6000 and uh, one uh, study uh, one uh, presenter mentioned that it's um, 5900 so uh, it's the the way it is quite different so there is there it was when uh, i am representing the uh, government of india and ministry so when we started uh, the work uh, the biggest challenge was that how to harmonize the things so the, uh, whatever the results we present here was our communication to netcom uh, that uh, through this uh, publication volume which is available on the internet and anyone can access it if someone wants a copy i will be happy to share it so uh, this these slides i will just skip because already it has been discussed a lot and these are just uh, general um, and we all know that carbon dioxide is uh, increasing uh, rapidly and we it has to be addressed and the uh, blue carbon ecosystem they play a vital role in global carbon sequestration and uh, with long term storage they act as a potential uh, carbon sinks so uh, this is a figure from macleod which clearly depict how the coastal vegetative ecosystems can sequester more carbon this already uh, dr raghavan has explained in detail so i will just go to um, uh, the uh, slide where we so we started with uh, the pan india perspective so when the government of india has implemented coastal zone regulation notification uh, 2011 the problem was first problem came with the area uh, that what is the exact area of indian mangroves or segra system or any blue carbon system or any eco sensitive uh, eco uh, areas so in crj notification these were classified in the zone 1 which needs uh, to be conserved and protected and there should be no human interference and they no development activity has to be there so there were nine a to k nine systems were defined like mangrove forest uh, sand dunes mud flats uh, national parks salt marsh turtle nesting sites horse hook habitat seagrass um, bird nesting site and um, um, uh, and um, uh, this uh, turtle nesting sites etc so these uh, the when 2000 notification uh, 2000 crj to 2011 notification came so uh, national center for sustainable coastal management where i work um, was given the task to map uh these coastal ecosystem to uh, and demarcate their exact area to have an uniform uh, number for the country and then we did an extensive um, mapping exercise in association with various partners and then we come up with uh, uh, a number that uh, dr raghavan also has mentioned that 5400 square kilometer of mangrove area that is as per the crj uh, 2011 notification so I've, now the new notification has come now again new mapping says will come and then again a different area um, a different area set uh, will be defined so uh, during this uh, mapping exercise we also um, uh, try to identify what are the type of species and uh, uh, how many genera and how they are distributed and then a uh, checklist was also prepared and when uh, if we talk about the carbon sequestration the carbon sequestration is incomplete um, when uh, without the uh, talking about the emission scenario, scenario that uh, there is always a debate for emission versus burial uh, so when we uh, uh, we uh, at the beginning of work we try to prepare an inventory from all the published work which uh, whatever has happened in india on uh, greenhouse gas emission from this coastal system and during the preparation of their inventory it was quite uh, tough um, because there was no uh, uh, methodology was not in form one set of researchers they used different methodology another set of researcher used different methodology so we uh, uh, we decided to take a um, huge uh, task in that we um, surveyed all the indian mangrove along the east coast of india and west coast of india uh, and um, uh, islands that is andaman nicobar and uh, lakshadweep in minicoy to come up with uh, a uniform number 
uniform number that can represent uh, 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 in an international platform what is the greenhouse gas emission from the indian mangrove what is the greenhouse gas emission from the indian cigarette system and how the, these are contributing so uh, overall if we put that together uh, we have seen that um, uh, even though andhra odisha west bengal Uh, they uh, uh, they show the highest CO2 flux, or uh, as Kadrishan sir and uh, they said that uh, Bay of Bengal is a major contributor to GHG flux. But at the same, we have to see the global the extent of the uh, mangrove area is very high in that. So net carbon uh, sequestration potential is very high. So I will come into the come to that into the next slide. But in the same case, Maharashtra the area is very small. Uh, that is Thane and Ratnagiri, but Thane itself has a, having a very high CO2 flux. That is mainly due to the sewage. If mangrove were not there, so if mangrove were not sequestering, so net CO2 is, uh, fluxes were very high. So uh, the, uh, similarly, in case of uh, uh, methane fluxes, also Maharashtra, due to the Thane, the extensive sewage input has resulted in high fluxes despite of having a very small area. so the carbon uptake we also uh, the uh, important thing is that how much the carbon is taking uh, um, being uptake by the plant that is a photosynthetic rate so we with uh, leaf area index and then ndvi we also try to calculate and compute the net carbon uptake in the different uh, mangroves uh, that and the mangrove for waste cost somewhere it were varying between the uh, 3.2 megagram carbon per hectare to 35.44 megagram per hectare and highest carbon uptake rate were observed from uh, sundarban that is a uh, hereditaria exocaria and avicennia community showed the highest carbon uptake rate and in case of uh, waste cost the uh, uptake rate were comparatively lesser but they still uh, they were the highest uptake rate was approximately 27 megagram carbon per hectare per year or uh, carbon uptake rate was observed in the K in waste cost so when we talk about the burial several researchers has uh, taken uh, above ground biomass um, uh, as professor kadirisan was kadirisan was uh, rightly saying that most of the researchers has focus on the um, above ground bio biomass and till now we don't have an uh, dedicated equation for measuring uh, mangrove biomass whatever we uh, we are using to uh, allometric equation we are using we are using from the foreign authors or international research that we are applying to this one the uh, terrestrial forest forest we do have but for uh, mangrove forest we are yet to derive a, um, a dedicated e uh, equation which is which will be applicable for the uh, indian mangroves so uh, again then uh, uh, during the course of our study we also tried to come calculate uh, or compute the net carbon stock in the sediments uh, that if we take a one uh, one meter of the soil then how much of the carbon is stored um, for in longer period of time as uh, professor gadirisan was rightly saying that due to the anaerobic or anoxic environment in the mangrove these carbons are stored uh, for a long very long period of time because their escape rate or their rate of degradation is lower but here one uh, thing that i want to bring to you notice that which has to be focused in case of um, uh, carbon sequestration research that most of the researcher they do focus or they uh, when while measuring the carbon sequestration rate or carbon sequestration potential they take sediment organic carbon as a base the sediment organic carbon uh, when measure it takes the mineralizable and then uh, um, calcitrant and then which uh, non mineralizable carbon all type of carbon it will uh, oxidize and it will give you the the uh, uh, carbon content in percentage but that is in the case not the case what is mineralizable carbon that will be immediately released due to the uh, due to various microbiological or um, chemical activity and a part will go only go for the sequestration so uh, so again uh, that uh, uh, we uh, we try to or we are in process of uh, from these sediments we are in process of uh, 
partitioning car uh, segment organ carbon into various component and to arrive at that exact uh the nature of the carbon which actually goes at the burial for the longer period of time not the rapid uh, not uh, the portion which is repetitively uh, micro uh, degradable due to various uh, physical and biological and chemical activity so same thing if we uh, for if we talk about the sediment carbon stock what i Uh, uh, showed uh, um, in previous slide with respect to greenhouse gas emission. If you correlate both Maharashtra, the segment ca organic carbon stock, uh, segment organic carbon stock, that is megagram per hectare, is very high. Uh, it, it is much higher than the West Bengal. Uh, yeah, which clearly indicate that whatever the uh, sediment which is accumulated in the upper layer of the sediment is. due to the sewage input this uh, carbon this very well correlates with the greenhouse gas emission from that area so even though in case of east coast that is west bengal odisha ap nitrogen the carbon what is the carbon that is inherent mangrove carbon and in case here it's the anthropogenically transferred carbon so while calculating the estimate of uh, carbon sequestration cap uh, carbon sequestration potential or Yeah, uh, to give give a result or to give a data set, we need to look at the environmental conditions also. That what are the factors which are influencing? If we uh, represent that uh, Maharashtra, uh, Maharashtra mangrove has a very high carbon sequestration potential, then it will give a wrong picture to that uh, the whole uh, thing. Uh, now uh, uh, coming to that problem, that uh, now we took a step forward that we uh, uh, we. Uh, Uh, took uh, 12 mangrove species from uh, various mangroves of india and we tried to identify uh, which specific uh, species will be more resilient or more uh, effective in in term of the climate change pers perspective or what type of the um, uh, species will be uh, more useful uh, more useful or will predominate over another in term of growth in term of carbon sequestration so we uh, we computed uh, inter specific variation in uh, mangrove stem mass biomass lignin cellulose contain an elemental composition and the sonoracea species Uh, showed low carbon uh, density and high ratio of cellulose and lignin that indicated that among all the species all the 12 st commonly found species this species has a faster growth and uh, with uh, when you want um, uh, immediate colonization of mangrove this can be act as a uh, uh, very uh, useful species and avicennia officinalis and heritaria has very high agp and carbon sequestration potential whereas heritaria and lilitoris and uh, candelia candle were low uh, were higher lignin content and uh, it shows that higher potential to sustain abiotic and abiotic stress and they showed higher recalcitrant biomass that means that the, the whatever the carbon store in this uh, mangrove or whatever the mango uh, mango uh, organic carbon originating from this uh, mangrove ecosystem will be stored in the sediment for a longer period of time so uh, this is just a glimpse for already a lot of people has talked uh, a lot has been spoken about the mangrove so i will just quickly glimpse uh, give glimpse of the about the seagrass also seagrass is also one of the most vital ecosystem um, uh, coastal ecosystem but it has it was quite neglected in study one of the drawback uh, uh, of uh, seagrass that uh, uh, the access uh, to uh, study uh, to study seagrass is quite difficult Uh, that you have to have a um, underwater experience and then sampling is also quite tricky so uh, that's why the seagrass uh, research uh, uh, has been uh, still in native stage and there has been quite a progress in last 10 years but um, uh, the amount of research which has gone to seagrass is very less as compared to mango uh, ecosystems so uh, same in case of seagrass uh, seagrass uh, like uh, if we talk about the continuum uh, mangrove act as a sediment trap and then seagrass and then coral seagrass also act as a trap if you talk see about the park bay ecosystem they are very beautifully protecting the coral ecosystem which uh, also lying by trapping the excess uh, sediment uh, uh, 
um, excess sediment and then um, the the uh, uh, they helping so it's a, a continuum which is mangrove seagrass uh, uh, and then coral so uh, coral health uh, is also quite much influenced by the seagrass not only that but also they help in the reducing the nutrient load by, by uptaking the nu uh, nutrient so uh, nutrient enrichment they also release they are also an oxygen pump of the uh, coastal ocean so uh, i will not and then uh, again the, uh, like professor kadrisan was uh, telling that uh, this carbon sequestration and uh, uh, potential is also dependent on seasonality salinity and other things same thing is uh, uh, in case of seagrass seagrass a salinity loving plant so whenever there is a high rain is there or there is a less fresh water is uh, high fresh water is there they are reduced they are stressed so their carbon sequestration potential is also reduced where in case of high salinity they flourish very well and uh, this uh, uh, this data and see uh, we, if we are now we uh, compared the dg emission by seagrass ecosystem so chilika chilika bay and park bay chilika dg emissions are um uh, comparatively lesser but park bay at the same time uh, park bay has the area uh, net area extent area is park bay is 330 square kilometer and chilka is 75 square kilometer uh, when we compare jd emission from mangrove versus seagrass you see uh, seagrass despite uh, uh, that um, uh, see uh, the net of mangrove area is uh, 5400 square kilometer from uh, india so Uh, seagrass uh, the, the net uh, 511 gigagram carbon dioxide uh, per year it is emitting whereas the seagrass is emitting only 16 gigagram per year so uh, uh, the productivity uh, uh, seagrass productivity is very high uh, respiration uh, respiration uh, 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 net productivity in the wet season is uh, Uh, get a little reduced because of the fresh water stress, but overall the seagrass productivity is very high, and they act as an oxygen pump. And we uh, talk if you talk about the tropic stress, net uh, ecosystem metabolism uh, is um, uh, in in case of Chilka southern sector is the area where most of the seagrass are located. So you can see the net eco ecosystem metabolism that is a uh, uh, primary productivity minus respiration. Uh, that is a uh, uh, there only it's a positive um, or more or less positive. Whereas in case of other Uh, sectors that in northern sector central sector and outer channel where uh, in case of chilika uh, the where the, which are devoid of seagrass their primary productivity is uh, uh, less than the respiration so they act as a potential carbon sink i will just come to uh, this and again the for in case of seagrass uh, uh, the root shoot ratio like in case of mangrove the above ground biomass and below ground mass uh, below ground biomass which is often a neglected uh, the aspect of mangrove but it also act as a major sink uh, it is a key uh, key factor while uh, they are deciding the while uh, calculating the carbon sequestration potential of mangrove similarly in case of seagrass it's a, a net uh, uh, root biomass which is a uh, uh, which is a uh, more uh, the higher the root biomass more is the carbon sequestration potential of that particular and similarly cymodesia and halodule which are having the high root biomass they uh sequesters more carbon and uh, this uh, already as discussed that uh, uh, with the depth uh, the about uh, 30% that is a very transient and uh, mangrove that is the active zone this is the place where um, uh, all the microbiological and other activity takes place when uh, we should be very careful uh, while taking the whole sediment uh, organic carbon in uh, our calculation for sediment uh, sed uh, net sediment Uh, organic car carbon burial or uh, net carbon sequestration so uh, however the in case of the deep sediment we can safely compute into the net now if we talk about the coal um, uh, if we talk about the carbon sequestration budget in uh, chilika chilika that is a lagoon in odisha uh, that we calculated in that that um, uh, net respiration is 0.08 teragram carbon whereas the burial is 0.06 uh, net burial is 0.06 Teragram carbon and uh, in sediment overall uh, the storage is 0.76 teragram of carbon 
and uh, similarly we also competed for the uh, carbon budget in park bay and we calculated for whole india how um, the uh, net carbon sequestration uh, will be uh, with uh, uh, uh with uh, uh, in uh, with uh, 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 per hectare in uh, sigra sigra system so net primary production uh, rate varies from 2.3 to 4.35 megagram carbon per hectare per year where a sediment some sediment stores almost 100 to 150 megagram um, organic carbon per hectare and below the ground my below ground my mass and above ground my mass around 1 megagram carbon per hectare is the above ground my mass whereas around 3 megagram carbon per hectare is the below ground my mass so to summarize uh, uh, wetland and uh, submerged aquatic uh, 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 vegetation uh, they contribute significantly to global carbon sink uh, this is already a uh, published paper by macleod a highly referred paper and we compared with the, our result that coastal and all india uh, that with uh, 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 how the sediment organic carbon stocks in major forest ecosystem so even though the area the area of uh, mangrove ecosystem are very low or coastal ecosystems are very low is around 0.4% of the total uh, uh, forest area of india but uh, you can see the net cars, uh, net uh, organic carbon burial per square kilometer is quite high so um, uh, while computing the uh, net carbon stock will uh, Uh, of uh, foreign uh, country these uh, coastal ecosystem uh, will play a major role and their conservation and protection is very much important and very much uh, uh, required so uh, uh, the uh, i in i and dc india is committed to create an additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion tons by creating uh, by uh, uh, additional forest and tree cover by 2030 and you can clearly see the net carbon accrual per hectare per year uh, in case of mangrove is 1.69 mangrove uh, megagram per uh, megagram whereas in case of sigra is 1.66 megagram per year and if we increase the 20% of the area cover uh, then we can uh, we can create an additional sink of 669 gigagram for of uh, carbon by in mangrove ecosystem or an 84 gigagram of carbon in sigra ecosystem the values are uh, high in case of mangrove because in case of mangrove the biomass is high uh, as net biomass is high as compared to sigra uh, and re restoration of 100 hectare uh, will reduce the carbon emission per year by uh, 144 gigagram uh, uh, a uh, restoration of 100 hectare will reduce the uh, reduce uh, re restoration of 100 hectare of mangrove will uh, reduce carbon dioxide uh, carbon dioxide emission by 144 gigagram and uh, restoration of 100 gram of seagrass will uh, uh, reduce the carbon dioxide emission by 52 gigagram so in general if we talk about that one hectare of uh, just is this is a cal uh, general calculation um, that we try to uh, make it as simple for simpler form for the policy maker or common man who understand who can understand the importance of why we need to sequester these uh, coastal ecosystem these uh, uh, mangrove uh, the coastal community do understand their significance their importance they are uh, why they because they depend they know the depend they know that is so used for firewood honey collection fisheries and this thing but seagrass mostly fishermen they use as a, they think that it's a waste when they uh, the seagrass leaves get stuck in the boat propellers and then it ca often causes damage so they take it consider as a wasteland so uh, to uh, uh, give them a importance uh, or to make uh, them uh, feel uh, make them understand what is the so we, we made it here simpler that one term, one acre of seagrass can sequester up to 335 uh, 3350 gram of carbon per year and it can mitigate carbon dioxide emission from a, a car which is traveling around 6000 km square, square kilometer it absorbs 2.9 kg of nutrient per year so uh, that is equivalent to treated different of uh, five, around 500 people and it gives a uh, ecosystem uh, services worth 11 lakhs rupees per year thank you thank you dr gurmeet thank you for uh, an, another comprehensive presentation and taking us through the realm of uh, seagrass ecosystem uh, under this blue carbon ecosystem we have 
spoke in detail about mangroves. So thank you for bringing seagrass into the discussion. I think it is very clear the important importance of uh, mapping and documenting the the area under these ecosystem because if we don't know what is present where it is difficult. And another important point that I think you both, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Kathleen and you highlighted is the un uh, developing understanding of below ground uh, carbon, which is often underestimated or understudied. So uh, with that, I would, uh, we have a little bit of crunch of time now. Initially, I was thinking we'll have extra time. So I asked our family members to expand their uh, presentation. So we, we let, let's, take a few interesting questions before um, I hand it over to Dr. Nehru for a summary and wrap up of today's session. So this question is for Dr. Uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't say anything specifically, but there's a question from Dr. Rani Varghese, and she is asking, how can we improve carbon sequestration potential of aquaculture converted mangrove habitat? So basically, I think she's asking rehabilitation of these areas uh, in a manner that uh, they can, um, you know, uh, correspond to uh, a healthy, productive mango ecosystem. So anyone who wants to answer can uh, speak. Please uh, be brief, though. In Philippines, the degraded aquaculture lands have been rehabilitated successfully by flushing with the sea water and then they have successfully grown mangroves in Philippine area. So that successful model can be taken to our country and then we can do it. What is important is flushing with the sea water uh, is very important because the soil is already acidic because of the aquaculture practice. If you can make it you know, uh, you know, uh, with the uh, sea water, then uh, we can rehabilitate it very well, and then we can increase the carbon sequestration potential of mangroves in that area. So following up on, uh, there's another question about, uh, I think you showed one interesting slide with those, you know, fishbone-like canal structure. There's a question, is this pattern created by hand digging or does it require uh, specialized machinery? Can you- It's only on hand digging, only hand digging. People are, local people are involved in uh, digging the soil so that they can get to the livelihood, you know, employment opportunity and participatory, uh, you know, opportunity. And I think we will have one of the uh, speaker or panel member tomorrow from MSSRF to maybe uh, discuss a little bit more about this. Because I recall this was uh, in conjunction with MSSRF, isn't it, Professor Kathiresh? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, stay tuned for tomorrow's program for a little more detail on that one. And then there was uh, another question uh, that, again, for you, uh, Professor Kathiresh, uh, do, you, do you have any reason uh, why a mangrove cover has been decreasing in Tamil Nadu over time? Uh, actually, in Tamil Nadu, what had happened, uh, we have a 45 square kilometer area, and due to Gaja, Gaja cyclone, you know what happened the green cover reduced but now the natural regeneration is taking place even in amban you know amban cyclone in west bengal sundarban there was a devastating effect but still the coppicing takes place in mangroves because the restoration and the regeneration natural regeneration uh, the coppicing ability is very high with the mangroves. After some time, it gets uh, regenerated. The leafing is taking place and things like that. We have to wait for some time, you know, uh, for the recovery. But it is very quick recovery. Every year, you know, in Gujarat, we used to get, uh, you know, defoliation and something like that, due to cyclone, you know. You know, afterwards, you know, you would get uh, the leafy very quickly. So it, it depends. It depends upon the condition and the severity of this stress. Okay. Thank you. And then one last question, if uh, anyone uh, has a response to that. There's a question about uh, uh, monitoring uh, and evaluation for mangrove conservation in India by fishery or forestry law and regulations. So I, I believe there are uh, these uh, 
you know regulations in place forest department or the mangrove divisions have their own uh, working plans and, and and their process um they may not be as efficient but they are there as far as i know but if se someone has any more um, insights into this process you would like to add briefly in a minute or two Dr. Uh, Gurmeet, would you like to say something? Uh, oh, sorry, I was. Uh, uh, can you repeat the question? I, I was just going through the comments, so uh, just okay. uh, sorry. Something about monitoring and evaluation uh, from okay. sort of a law and regulation perspective. So the government's role in. I know you touched upon. No, no yes. Uh, yeah, monitoring and evaluation um, in case of uh, like. Uh, um, fishery and forestry law, but uh, 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 these coastal ecosystems are governed under the coastal regulation zone. Uh, uh, that is, uh, 2000, uh, earlier it was 2011, now it's 2019. They are uh, monitoring and evolution is uh, entirely governed within that. And that not only if you talk about the not only the fiscal uh, governance, the fiscal governance, but that means the conservation, protection, and restoration, as well as the economic also, right? Uh, like uh, eco ecosystem evolution, also that how much what is the monetary value associated with this all ecosystem this entire thing is governed by this uh, coastal regulation zone um, crz notification 2019 and 2011 so we have a promotory approach of management for mangroves we have identified 38 mangrove areas all along the coastal area in all the 38 mangrove areas management action plan you know is being implemented Continuous monitoring is being done. The evaluation is also done on the management practices by government of India. Thank you, Dr. Kathiraj. So I think uh, uh, this is about time. Uh, we should uh, uh, go to the summary and conclusion for today's very insightful, very productive and rewarding discussion. Uh, I would have wished a little more time for discussion, but uh, the, the, the conference has just begun today's first day. Tomorrow we will delve deeper into other aspects of mangrove, uh, seascape, coastal uh, environment and have more discussion. But uh, to wrap our uh, today's uh, deliberations, we have Dr. Nehru, who is a TBT inspired faculty at uh, Wildlife Institute of India. He's also one of the co-conspirator with me in uh, uh, developing this workshop and inviting all of you. So I would also like to thank him for uh, going along and, and uh, sort of encouraging, supporting, coming up with ideas to make this event uh, uh, happen and in this place. Um, I invite Dr. Nehru to summarize today's event and uh, uh, provide some comments and wrap up today's uh, proceedings. Over to you, Dr. Nehru. Yeah. So uh, it, it was a wonderful uh, day. Uh, we had a very good uh, number of participants. Uh, I see that at least 100 participants across the day of the event. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of uh, talks today about carbon sequestration and carbon stocks of mangroves and the day is dedicated for that. And uh, I thank all the speakers and all the uh, uh, speakers and participants for being engaged. And uh, also the speakers were very, you know, delivered their talks. Uh, at a very relevant, you know, made relevance to the topics on the theme of the day. And uh, it's, it was a wonderful uh, discussion. And uh, there are certain things, uh, I mean, so, uh, some of the speakers have emphasized on the knowledge gaps already. We have saved, you know, we have, we have session for it, but already we've been hearing some of the you know, knowledge gaps where we should focus the future research on, especially the you know, use of um, a yeah, comprehensive method that could deliver a, a results of, you know, uh, national level and that could be compared with international level studies. So uh, we definitely need to go forward in that angle. And uh, then there were, uh, Dr. Prof uh, Professor Kadirajan emphasized how this uh, seasonal variations in carbon stock assessments 
uh, need to be made and the role of microbes and uh, macro benthos in um, carbon sequestration so these studies need to come up and also uh, like dr gurmeet mentioned the data need to be you know unified so that we have a comprehensive sense of indian mangrove uh, systems and especially in the carbon stock assessment uh, so and we are we have a very interesting day coming up tomorrow and uh, like today it was mostly about you know the nature based solution and carbon stocks especially but tomorrow we going to have a very broader uh, topics and we have very good interesting uh, number of speakers of different backgrounds academy uh, academicians and uh, people from uh, uh, ngos and policy makers so we are looking forward to a very interesting session tomorrow and i hope uh, all of you could join us tomorrow and uh, maybe you can also spread a word with interesting people so that we can have a very interesting sessions coming up tomorrow so with that i thank all the people for and uh, for being with us today and hope to see you all tomorrow as well thank you thank you dr nehru so uh, before i formally sort of close the event i would uh, like to thank all the support and encouragement provided by our institutes uh, dr dhananjay mohan uh, from wii and uh, uh, our director dr robert nasi c porigraf uh, they have been very supportive of this idea and uh, our funding uh, agency usaid under swamp program without which this would not have been possible I would also like to uh, thank our technical team for uh, being with us in this flawless and smooth transition from speakers to presentations Uh, so this was great i uh, i look forward to welcoming you all again tomorrow same time same place thank you again have a good day bye bye for now